Welcome everyone! You may be sleeping, you may be dreaming, you may even be having a night terror, uh, because this is episode 364 of Comics from the Multiverse, your DC Comics podcast. I am Peter, and joining me in today's nightmares is Matt. Yeah, every time I do a show with Pete, it's a, it's a bit of a night terror. <laughs> I dare you. He's, he's our own Freddy Krueger. Yeah, yeah. Uh, don't worry, you'll, you'll get a taste of what Connor thinks of Night Terrors next week. You'll be swapping Matt for Connor next week. Yeah. Uh, tag fact, in, tag out. Connor would have been here for a, a trio mm-hmm. episode this week, but the selfish prick had an anniversary that he needed to spend yeah. the day dealing with instead. I I saw him like going get into a comic, so I thought he was gonna, I thought he was making an effort to be on. And then when I was like, I asked him, he says, oh no, I'm doing stuff. And I was like, oh, okay. Effort? Him? Yeah, I know. <laughs> That's what surprised me, Pete. Baffling, uh, baffling. Yeah. So, yeah. But anyway, so it is July. Uh, we, are, we are in now the, the two-month period of Night Terrors. We got one regular book this week, and I think that will be mm-hmm. true for most weeks. There'll be one or two of the regular books that are slipping through, mm-hmm. but most of the regular books are on pause, and we've got two months of Night Terrors. This is a DC Comics podcast. I'll tell you what's coming up in today's show, and I will be saying the phrase Night Terrors a lot in this list. So, <laughs> coming up today, we have Night Terrors First Blood Issue 1, or as I think it should be called, Night Terrors Issue 1. <laughs> Why yeah. it's not just called Issue 1 and it's a five issue series. I, I hate, I don't know where it started. I don't know if it was Marvel or I don't know if it was tying in, but with the Alpha and Omega stuff, just give us an issue one. Oh, yeah, I hate that too. I do. I, like, th- this is different, though, because this is a four issue miniseries, except yep. this issue is before the four issues, and it's very clearly. The start of the story. It's, like when it's we when we talk, even, yeah. yeah, when we talk about this issue, it is def- You have to read it. There's no way you yeah, can jump into issue one next week. It's not a prologue. It's a chapter one. Yeah, and that's, so, that's terrible. Absolute nonsense. Maybe it's because yeah. they thought, oh, it didn't sound neat. They wanted two issues per yeah. month. Well, tough. You had three this month. Just deal with it. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> We also have <laughs> Night Terror's Batman issue one, Matt Red Night Terror's Poison Ivy issue mm-hmm. one, we have Night Terror's Ravager issue one, and I read Night Terror's Black Adam issue one, meaning the only casualty out of all the Night Terror's books this week was mm-hmm. the Joker one, which, uh, you know, it's the same writer as the ongoing yeah. book that neither of us were mm-hmm. reading, so it, it yeah, yeah. Well, it, this is not surprising. Well, and, and there's a, there's something less I want to read, I mean, we'll get there Right, there's Batman. Then, then what Joker's nightmare is, which is probably incredibly mundane, right? Because he's so crazy. What is he? What is he afraid of? And that's normalcy. Um, so yeah, yeah. So uh, we also have Adventures of Superman, John Kent issue five, <laughs> and I have some Patreon books to do. Uh, so I will be talking about American Vampire issue thirty four, which I believe is the final issue of the first volume. Cycle. You know, that's, that's, yeah. yeah, the first cycle, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, before it had like some specials and yep. uh, uh, you know a volume two and whatnot, so yeah. Now uh, after that, now you're in no man's land for me. That'll be all new mm. stuff because I I started the second cycle and then I was like, oh wait for trade, and I never went back. So uh, what, I, I, next I think I started it as well at the time, but it was very inconsistent, and I was reading yep. monthly at this point, so I ended mm-hmm. up leaving it behind. Uh, so yep. it will it will be exciting to get into some of that as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we also have uh, New Teen Titans issue 37, but not because it's a crossover with uh, Batman the Outsiders, so it's yep. uh, New Teen Titans this, this time. So that is what's coming up on the show this week. Uh, we will brave this terror of July and August uh, with bravery, honor, yes. dignity, and... and then whatever I bring to the table. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, dear. So, yeah, uh, we'll get into everything. But, of course, we're going to start the show with everyone's favorite segment, especially Matt's. Yeah. Which is the <sighs> Comixology Top Ten. What did you take today? Uh-huh. You, have, you have this boundless energy that I'm not used to. Did you sleep well last night? I slept okay, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. You woke up knowing Connor wasn't going to be on. Like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Maybe. You, you were not this energetic the last two two shows. I don't know. It's, it's very weird. Maybe I'm just, you know, I feel like bringing it today. I just I want to give people an irritated show. I, you know, I'm yes. trying not to be bogged down in the mundanity of of everything. Maybe it's because yeah. I know when we get to talking about Night Towers, the entire tone of the show is going to, to dip. Well, and I'm just... 
I, I thought fart. that too. And so like we were dreading this and then if they're going to be as bad as some of these were, it's actually <laughs> probably going to be fun to talk about with you guys. You know, like, no, I'm not saying I'm not tipping my hand, but they're, they're not all great. <laughs> so, um, but it, it might just be fun to, to discuss and just know we're in this together, you know, and there's someone else that we can, you know, do this with. But it's Comicsology Top 10. Yes. I have a guess for, for the Tuesday. Oh, go on. Okay. Choose uh, the, the top selling book on Comicsology yeah. as of right now, per the rankings. What do you, you think? I, I'm guessing Night Terror's First Blood. Is yeah. I mean, I don't really feel like giving you points for that because yeah, that was easy. Now here's the real one. What, what's going to be number two, right? Uh, and it's either Joker or Batman. I'm going to guess Batman. Nope. Wow. Oh my goodness. Is it Superman? It's Adventures of Superman. John All Kent. right. Which Tom Taylor sells. Tom Taylor sells. I also don't think it's surprising that other than the actual main event book, that the regular book that has consistent fans is doing better than the tie-ins, yeah. which I think a lot of people probably say, okay, I'll read the main story to see you know, what's going mm-hmm. on, but I don't need all the tie-ins because they're just gouging me for money, basically. I, I just figured that it, you know, Batman is, is a pretty consistent top seller, so why why would a Night Terrors label uh, get in the way of that? But I'm happy to see that the, the John Kent book... I mean, given that the, the Batman Night Terrors tie-in is written by Williamson, it means it's probably one of the more important tie-ins um right. and given that we've read it and we'll talk about it later that seems mm-hmm. to be the case but yeah still a tie-in so fundamentally yeah. the regular ongoing book well, it's not even ongoing it's just a miniseries but no. you know it's, mm-hmm. it's it's been consistent so number four or sorry number three is batman three. night terrors uh, and right. number four is night terrors joker number five is night terrors poison ivy hey. uh, number six is steelworks issue two number seven is night terrors ravager Number eight is Night Terror's Black Adam. Number nine is Peacemaker Tries Hard. Mm-hmm. And number 10 is actually, well, it's technically a trade, but it, <laughs> so it's, it's, it's the One Bad Day uh, Penguin uh, book. Okay. But, te- but you know, it's, it's weird because technically it's just the same, maybe with some bonus content as the single issue was, but right. they're, they're doing the hard covers, so they're getting digital releases, which feels almost a little redundant because the digital yeah. releases were already the full thing. Anyway, I, I don't know. I mean, I no. guess for bonus, if if you really want that, but I feel you're if you are you're waiting for the hardcover, you're not going to get that digitally. So that is a little bit weird. I mean, if they do a bundle where you can get like yeah. half or all of them for a good discount because they're mm-hmm. together, then I get that being released digitally. But right, but this own, is but, yeah, yeah. It's, it's weird. Yeah, I was wondering seeing that in the comicsology list when when it came out. Getting my books this week. Yeah, n- number eleven is the two faced one, so two of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, came out this week but um yeah so that's basically that uh not much to say obviously it's more trades and stuff after that point and yeah. graphic novels uh look at wednesday's books wednesday's numbers uh for marvel and the rest of the industry do you have a guess for number one i'm looking for anything with a banner all right so i'm, I'm gonna guess x-men before the fall sinister four that's correct that's your one Boom. Of whatever this new kieran gillen whatever X-Men there's because. there's so many uh, number so two many. is X Men twenty four, so another X Men book. Uh, yeah. Number three is Daredevil issue thirteen. Number yeah. four is Fantastic Four issue nine. Uh, number five is Captain America seven fifty, and that's an eight dollar anniversary extravaganza. Special. Yeah, it's so uh, not even coming up here on League of Comic Geeks. Number six is Doctor Strange issue five. Number seven is Thor Annual twenty twenty three issue one. Number eight is Spider Man issue ten. Number and that's just that's just Spider Man, not amazing Spider Man. Yeah, no adjectives. Yeah. Uh, number nine is Star Wars issue thirty six, and number ten is Venom issue twenty two. So, hmm. yeah. nice. Picked up my first Scott Snyder book in in a long time today. Well, today, this week, uh, Barnstormers came out in physical. Right, that was part of his release that was digital only. It's funny uh, you say that because they just uh, announced his next digital only series. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a sci-fi mm-hmm. thing set in the fifties. Yeah. yeah, so I'll I'll let you guys know when I get around to it. But it's Tula Lote art uh, with Scott Snyder oh. doing like thirties, uh, forties aerial stuff. So it's it's right up my alley. Uh, so yeah, well, these new ones with Albuquerque, so it's a, a reunion of uh, yeah, I, American vampire. I saw 
there was another one that I think he did with Frank Avila that Tim just picked up. I think so. Like yeah, Night yeah, the yeah. That, that was the one you set so, during the war. Yeah, the horror book. Yeah. So oh, I'm glad Snyder's doing stuff, but it felt good to pick up a, a Scott Snyder book that uh, that I'm excited for uh, this week. So, uh, but but yeah, I actually. There's no DC news this week that I could find, uh, but mm-hmm. when browsing the news, there's a couple of things I wanted to mention. Is uh-huh. one how stupid some news articles are on various Did websites, in, in particular Newsarama uh, for this case. But there's literally an article when I was browsing that said, "When is episode four of Secret Invasion? We've got the answers right here." And all I could think was. Is it not just one week after the last episode? Why are people confused? Why is there an article <sighs> explaining how episodic TV works? Anything for those clicks. It's absolutely maddening. Like, I clicked Anything? on it to look at it just to see, is, is there a reason why they're feeling the need to explain Like, is it being moved? It's... Is it delayed? Is it uh, something? And yeah. I don't think so. I, th- I think it's just, this is the next episode. This is when it's coming out. Because people are too dumb to understand how a weekly release schedule works, apparently. Oh my god! I see. I see it now. Where where it is? Yeah, that is just the headline. That's all. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to click on it. Don't click on it. To, don't, yeah. I, I I regret clicking on it just to, to, for the investigative reasons that I did. I don't. And you know what? So like, I used to get worried because I can't watch that stuff uh, day and date. Like, I I have to wait at least till I get home from work. And so anytime the new Marvel show dropped or the new Star Wars show, I would immediately like start banning words, you know, from from the social medias. And as each has yeah. gone on, Connor, I've had Ryan. Yeah, <laughs> uh, as well, he doesn't watch the well, he doesn't watch Star Wars. But um, anyway, uh, as as these have each gotten on, I've had to worry about it less. And it's actually kind of nice that. I kind of forgot Secret Invasion was a thing. It's because no one cares about it. That's why. Until, until you just mentioned it. And I'm going to watch it. I'm going to get around to it. Um, but, but yeah. I, I, I was uh, reading a fascinating... So we're, so we're in the sort of tangent news part of the, yeah. the show right now. I, so there was an article this week talking about how Disney's bubbles kind of burst and how all of yeah. their movies are underperforming this year. Uh, mm-hmm. Obviously, Indy just underperformed. Guardians yeah. did okay, but all the other Marvel stuff, the the newest Pixar movie under like everything's uh-huh. you know lukewarm at best. Yep. And it was basically like, yeah, eventually this formula of it's... doing all these franchises was going uh-huh. to slow down and whatnot. But I read an interesting bit of analysis specifically about how they might have made it worse with launching Disney Plus and mm-hmm. how basically having all these extra Marvel shows coming out and also this like weird expectation that everything will be on there about a month or two after it comes out mm-hmm. anyway has actually harmed their box office and i i think even just aside from the financial things i do think like when the first mcu show launched like one division and it felt kind yeah. of like an event it was kind of a big deal it was their first yeah. show no one's talking about secret invasion no one cares I've, I've and seen this is no one yeah, talk this about is it. one that i was excited about because it's got fury and it's it's these threads that have i don't say forgotten about but they're kind of in the, on the back burner compared to some of the other stuff that's been going on but like i haven't felt any promotion for it it just kind of it snuck up and when i went to see indiana jones last week with my brother we got a little blurb for it at the theater you know and i was like oh yeah that's a show he's like oh yeah i watched the first episode I, I forgot to watch it, episode two. Um, this is someone, you know, these are people that were excited for it. So, you know, I, I just think it, it was a bit too aggressive. And it's also why kind of Iger came back, I feel, because I think he has a little bit more restraint uh, and control than than the other guy did. Um, but we'll see. And for me, it's a shame with Indy because Indy is very good. Uh, no, it's not. So... Yes, it was. No, it's not, Matt. Yes, it is. No, you're yes, it blinded is. by rose-tinted nostalgia no. glasses. It's not that good. It's mediocre it good. at best. Mm-mm. No, it's it's easily the third best one. Easily, depending how you feel about Temple of Crusade. So, uh, you know, it is it is good. Don't listen to Pete. Listen to the guy that knows. <laughs> the action okay. is so boring. There's so much... like. The action's terrible, Matt. It's, no, there's like, I disagree. There's like five car slash motorbike chases yeah. that do nothing interesting. I will say, yes, they, they are redundant, but I like the action scenes. It's so like repetitive. People, there's, so. There's, a, like, there's a moment early on, right? I won't spoil uh-huh. context. We're not going to give yeah. any plot spoilers or anything like that. But there's a moment early on, and it's a flashback scene, but there's a moment early on yes. where Indy, Indy is a shot of him running across the top of a train. And uh-huh. it made me so sad 
because the reason why Raiders of the Lost Ark is so good is because mm-hmm. they had stuntmen doing stunts and everything looked impressive. And this little CG Indiana Jones is running across yeah. the train. You can tell the CG because the animation's all wonky and he looks yeah. like a, a little figure in a video game. It's sad. It, it has none of the heart disagree. that Indiana Jones is. It's missing everything that Indiana Jones is supposed to be. I, it, I disagree. It's, it is a cynical that's real out poor old our Harrison Ford. No, it's a nice <laughs> It's a nice proper, you know, retirement tour for Indiana Jones. Uh, him him realizing his place and everything. The movie would be better so, served if they didn't force him to go on an adventure. Nah. No, I, I like it. There, my problems came up with some of the other character stuff, but the, the Indiana Jones stuff throughout, I, I'm fine with. There, I mean, not to, to pit Nick or nitpick. There are certain storyline stuff that I'd rather them not have done. But for Indy going on this adventure and he seems to get more lively as it goes on, I no, it was too long. I'll give it that. Like it didn't oh, need it's to be two and a half hours. Uh, most indie movies are about, you know, two, maybe, you know, two hours, two minutes at the longest. Uh, so it's a bit too long, but I I had a blast. Uh, and Pete's so far the most negative person that I've known. Most of the people I've seen or that I know that have seen it. It's it's fast in the whole word of mouth. So. It's a uh, bland, forgettable, really, just nostalgia nah. milking time. I, no, I, I I will tell you, as someone that defends Crystal Skull, it just made me look at Crystal Skull and just go, "Who yikes? Uh, maybe I drank too much Kool Aid." On, on you're that drinking Kool Aid right now. You don't yeah, realize no. it apparently, but you're no. drinking too much Kool Aid right I now. Thought, no, because I disagree with it about the action sequences. I thought they were fine. Um, but again, I also, I think I like James Mangold's action and his directing more than you do. So, uh, hey, I had no oh, problems with that. I've been a fan of Copland <laughs> since the nineties. I, yes, there yes, is, I know. there is no doubting my appreciation of James Mangold, but action is not his mm-hmm. strong suit. I mean, hell, even Logan, the worst parts yeah. of that movie are the action scenes. What's, yeah. What makes Logan good is the character drama. And yeah. the few times in Indiana Jones where he tries to do a bit mm-hmm. of character drama, those moments are actually not bad. It's the rest of it. It's the, oh, we man. have to do Indiana Jones stuff. That's the problem it, with that movie. Yeah. Nah. It shouldn't exist. Like, it, was, it was a false... And nah, the, the, they've, proven, they've proven that there's not a market for it anymore. It came out and bombed. Well, but that's the whole thing, too. I feel like they always over... Like, being a huge Indiana Jones fan, It was. it's never been, like, the Star Wars fans and the Marvel fans. And, like, I always felt like I was always out on my own little island uh, and stuff, even, even when Crystal Skull came out. Like, and so I just... Again, I'll I'll take a fifth movie. I was never going to, to be upset at a fifth movie. But, yeah, I never felt like there was that hardcore fandom like with some of this other stuff. Um, but still, I I think it's a fitting. I, again, I think it's the third best. I, I have no problem with the action sequences. I had a lot of fun with them. Uh, the characters, the, the villains, I thought were pretty good. So, I mean, anytime you get Boyd Holbrook as, as a bad guy, I'm, I'm there for it. That guy has a very punchable face. So, uh, but yeah, well, yeah. I give it a 5.5 out of 10 for everyone at home. Go, go, <laughs> I gave it an 8.5, so... Of course you did. Uh, yep. uh, go check out the Collector's Cut episode that just dropped uh, yesterday when this goes out. Uh, mm-hmm. Me and David went through the whole franchise, uh, each each of them being a good 90 minutes to two hours long discussions. In fact, the newest one was over two hours. We actually talked a lot so uh, just, about this one. Like, just just like the movie itself just like the movie itself there was a lot yep. to dive which, into which was your shortest was it crystal skull because you guys are just like no because hey, nah, that was like two. because there was a lot to talk about about yeah. bringing things back when they shouldn't be and why it shouldn't yeah. exist <laughs> like yeah. there was a lot to get into on top of like yeah. all the but, things that are in the movie i don't know i'd have to check i'll, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll tell you Hold on so yeah so the newest one was two hours and 22 mm-hmm. minutes crystal skull was exactly two hours Okay. Uh, Last Crusade was one hour and 39 minutes. Wow. Temple of Doom was one hour and 25 minutes. So that's probably the shortest, but I'll just confirm. Yeah, yeah Raiders was one hour 47 minutes. So yeah, Temple was the See, shortest. If I was, there, if I was there for Raiders, definitely would have gone over three. I'm just telling you that now. That's my favorite <laughs> movie of all time. I was very so. positive about Raiders. Yeah? Oh yeah, because you always, you always have been. It's anything past Raiders mean you uh, don't agree on. So, uh, but that's just old hat now. We've been doing this for almost 10 years. In November, it'll be 10 years, Pete. Oh, I know. I know. So, um, you know. But yes. So I cannot recommend uh, 
and I can't. Dial of Destiny at all. Did um, I wear my hat at the theater? Yes. Did I get looks from people? Yeah. However, <laughs> right behind me, there was a guy in full indie cosplay, so I wasn't the weirdest guy there. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know. Also, we sat in the like the luxury uh, seats. Very hard in a fedora because it lines up right with the back of my head. You know, it's not a typical movie theater chair that you can kind of just rest on. So uh, kind of made sitting difficult, but, you know, it was worth it. Yeah, just took the hat off. I did it at a certain point. I had to. <laughs> that was I didn't want to crease the brim because, you know. Yeah. Uh, also, 110 degree weather in a wool hat. I don't – there's no way that that was a real wool hat uh, back in mm. the day. I don't know what type of material Lucasfilm made his hat out of. But it had to be something way more breathable because let me tell you, just walking from the car into the casino where the theater was, I was dying. Uh, wool, wool is not it. So, oh, wow. but yeah. But back to the Disney bubble, though, and all that stuff. It, it's definitely we feel it because you know me and my wife are both big Disney fans, and we didn't go see the new Pixar movie. You know, and it was just like, yeah, we'll, we'll get to it because it'll, it'll be on Disney Plus. You know, unless it's something that we prioritize. Uh, then, and there hasn't been much from Disney. Like, she loves The Little Mermaid. Uh, the original is one of her favorite movies of all time. We didn't go see the live yeah, action. Yeah, that, that underperformed as well. That's another one. You yeah. know, and, and I mean, she's pretty much the target audience for that. And I've heard good things. Um, so it's just, it's like you you brought up, people have this mentality that I'll just wait for it. You and know, it's not, it's not just as to be fair. Like Flash underperformed, yeah. obviously. Other things mm -hmm. are underperforming. But like Disney have a lot of releases. And I think the key detail that came out is that this is the first year since 2014 that Disney won't have made a movie that had a billion dollar gross right. at the box office. Well, and is it movies? Is all movies across the board? Because I know Mario did pretty well. But like, I don't remember Fast X doing Fast well. Fast X didn't do that well domestically. I yeah. think it still did okay internationally but it definitely yeah. was down from the you know the, its peak of, yeah. of making money so i just think because you know going to see indie that was the most people i've seen in the theater since black panther uh we went opening night for wakanda forever and that that was pretty packed but uh everything else that we've been to the movies to see in between november and now it's been kind of sparse um so i just feel like movie you know movie theater uh I don't want to say viewership, attendance. I think it's down across the board too. So I know it probably is. It probably is. It's just it is fascinating um, that I think the pandemic sped some of this up. But yeah. like I was already feeling the superhero fatigue in yeah. general for movies a while ago. Um, never mind like Star Wars fatigue and other stuff, which obviously mm -hmm. I was going to feel quicker than most people. But I think. The interesting thing that now it's starting to reflect on the wider audience where, mm -hmm. you know, you've not even, well, maybe you've watched it now, but you hadn't even checked out Andor for ages. Like, you know, you weren't yeah. rushing to it. You know, no, I mean, I watched the first episode and I found it kind of boring. And I've been told, oh, you got to stick with it. And I'm like, you know what? All the other stuff I need to get caught up on. If you don't hook me on that first episode, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not coming back right away. Mm -hmm. So like, I, I still need to get caught up on the boys. And that's something I enjoy. I just, I can't. I can't binge the boys because there's a lot, you know. Uh, I need to take a break at a certain point. Uh, I mean, it's like eight so... episodes a season, Matt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But after about two, I, it, the boys wasn't one that like I could just watch back to back to back like my brother did. Um, I have to, you know, I gotta take breaks in between, and then I forget, and then all this other stuff. So and the sports happens, you know. Uh, and that, that takes priority, too. So that Just, yeah, get, no, just and, give the sports up. That's the easy solution uh, it, It's easier for football, like baseball. I have not watched an Angel game this season. It doesn't hurt that they have two of the best players, and they suck really bad still. Um, but for the most part, it, it's just hockey. So now I have watched more movies since the Stanley Cup ended than I had in, shoot, since last October when, when we were going through all the horror movies, huh. you know. So in the last month or so, I've watched more movies and, you know, it helps. It helps that I don't have to compete. Yeah, I've been trying to watch movies because I, I feel like I've been mm -hmm. I've been a little quiet on that front recently. Yeah. But the two things getting in my way are uh, Final Fantasy 16, which I've been playing yeah. a lot of. And which is also, weird to hear you say because I know you're not a Final Fantasy guy. Not so, traditionally, but I've been kind of... Yeah. Some of the newer ones have, have I've, drawn me in. I've heard it's very, very good. Um, and then also I've been watching season three of Ted Lasso. I'm halfway through uh, that. 
That's I so. just finished shrinking, uh, which you should probably give. That's pretty good. Um, you like Spin City, right? I mean, I did. It's been a long ass time since okay. I saw Spin City. Cause, well, because I know you're not a Scrubs fan, so I always bring it Bill Lawrence. I always bring Scrubs, but it has more of the tone of Spin City. Um, shrinking is very good. But now t- Ted Lasso is on. I almost started last night, but I didn't want to fall asleep, so I fell asleep watching Lethal Weapon instead. Um, which is kind of hard to do. I'm kind of kind of, but I've seen it a bunch. Uh, I got into not an argument, but a discussion with someone at work about when Joe Pesci's character came in, and we couldn't remember. It's without two. Looking for, at, for the record, it it's two? two. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> she said three, um, and I couldn't remember. And I was like, oh, I should watch these. And so last night I found them on Max, and they have all four of them. And so I'm gonna work my way through those yeah, now. Two is where Joe it's Pesci comes in. Three is when uh, Rene Rizzo comes Rizzo. in, and then four is right. Chris Rock, which right. Oh, it's weird to say that's where he came in because that's the last one. But you know that's what I mean. Yeah. 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 But uh, but yeah. So go through there. Um, it's still so good. That first movie, the first thirty minutes, very very entertaining cop stuff because Danny Glover really bringing the the tired energy. I mm. really the older I get, the more I appreciate it. Uh, to Mel Gibson's complete manic like that man's a maniac in, in all the best ways. So. But yeah. Out of curiosity, is it the extended cut that you watched or the regular cut? And you'll think, basically the, well, the yeah. only real main difference that I remember, yeah. and it's it's why I don't like the extended cut that much, even yeah. though the scene itself is fine, is yeah. that they basically introduce Riggs twice. So you get the scene at the tree place, right? Uh-huh. That introduces him. But yeah. then the extended cut, there's also like a shooter at a school or something like that that he goes to. Yeah, so no, no. this was no, this was the tree, um, the tree scene with him. Yeah, because well, no, first, well, first they're, you they're both in the extended cut. Like it doesn't remove one. Uh-huh. It, it, that's that's why it's kind of weird. Like because you yeah. get that scene and then you get this other yeah. scene where he just walks up to a sniper without flinching to show that he's crazy. And like we just did this, we just did this at a tree place. Yeah, no, there's no sniper scene. They, I, I distinctly remember that because I, I got up to where he. The last thing I remember was the jumper. The guy that's going to jump and, oh, yeah, and Riggs yeah, yeah. handcuffs him. That's the last thing I remember. And then Murtaugh pulls him in to, to basically, be like, why, why are you so insane? I could never be friends with you. And, you know, four movies later, <laughs> you know. But, uh, no, it's very, very good stuff. So, because uh, sometimes I, I have to go back because I remember watching all of those about high school uh, time. And then I've gone back and watched the first one during, like, the holiday season, right? Because it's Shane Black. And that, that's what he does. Um, yeah. but I haven't seen two or three in a very long time. Two, I remember two, four a lot. Yeah, two was always my favorite. Um, it's got obviously Joe Pesci kind of completes yep. the trifecta, so it's a bit funnier. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, don't get me wrong, one does have Gary mm-hmm. Busey, and that's a pretty big like obstacle to to claim over. Mm-hmm. But Joe, two has Matt. Uh, diplomatic immunity. Diplomatic immunity. Yeah, I am wait- I almost decided to start with two last night, but I was like, I, I should refresh with one. Um, and yeah, so pretty, pretty excited. But yeah, no, I, every so often I like to go back and rewatch things. Like last, last year, what did we do last year? I forget, but me and my wife went through and, and watched a bunch of, was it Rocky? It might've been, she was not too thrilled, whatever it was. Um, I have to go through my notes. Uh, but, but yeah, so we should talk about comics. Uh, we should. There was one other news thing I just wanted to mention briefly. Oh, go ahead. Uh, Jennifer Garner's coming back as Elektra in Deadpool 3 for some reason. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't have anything to add. I just thought that was something dumb I read. So <laughs> Cool. I, you know, I understand that Daredevil movie is not good, but I still have a lot of affection for it. Um. I mean, some people so, will argue that it's good. I, I didn't like it very much, but... I The director's cut is a lot better. It, you know, there's a lot more story threads in there. Um, but again, teenage me, completely different than, you know... Uh, with adult eyes, I can look on it and be like, yeah, this movie's flawed, but um, I think don't, they do get a lot of stuff right. Do not pretend you were a teenager when Deadpool came out. Not Deadpool. Daredevil. That's what I meant to say. Is Daredevil. Okay. Uh, not Deadpool. Fair enough. God damn, the, the D's got me. <laughs> I was like, you were you were at least no. in your twenties when Deadpool came yes, out. Yes, no, because we, we were doing the show. Because I remember when we covered <laughs> we covered the Daredevil. Or I just did it again. The Deadpool trailer. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. But but no, uh, when Daredevil came out, I was very much a teenager. Uh, in fact, got got into an argument 
uh, uh, on a date over Deadpool. I did it again, son of a over Daredevil. So it's funny how many say. stories you have that start with they get into an argument <laughs> yeah. uh, with X well, person. If, if you can, if you can believe, I'm a very opinionated person that has a big mouth. I don't know if you know this about me. <laughs> uh this came up once or twice yeah. uh, that's why i love when i come in here knowing that you're wrong about something because i get to relish on it like like dial of destiny when i know you're wrong about something and i get to just enjoy it guys let, let pete know that it, it's not he's wrong let pete know he's wrong i am not wrong about this you, you are wrong i am not wrong anyone with taste and I'll just say it, dignity. Uh, we'll, we'll see. I have plenty of dignity, thank you. <laughs> Taste, no. We all know this, though. Like We, we all know the decisions I make. Um, but dignity, I have in spades, thank you. No, nah, the George McFly cuts better. Uh, dial of density. <laughs> that is. That's a good one. Yeah, I, I have them occasionally. All right, yeah, we can talk about comics. Uh, let's get into it. Night Terrors, First Blood, Issue 1, Joshua Williamson writing with Howard Porter on the art. So this kicks off Night Terrors, mm -hmm. and we have Insomnia, who is... Is he new? I don't know. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he, she, they, whatever... Whatever kind of entity it is, is new. Because I had to do a deep dive on Dr. Destiny. Because I remember back in the days of Wizard Magazine, right? That's where I would get a lot of, like... I, I would get introduced to a lot of these, you know, more... Uh, what's the word? Like, like smaller characters. Um, and I remember them talking. It was, like, the most messed up moments in comics history. And high up on this list was... Uh, Dr. Destiny's diner visit. And there was a, a issue of, I believe it was Sandman where Dr. Destiny decides to get bored or decides he, he's bored and he goes into this diner and essentially, you know, takes free will away from the, pa uh, from the patrons before, um, dream can get there and, and stop him and just walks into a complete horror show. I think I read that uh, issue because I read the first yeah. uh, collection. I think it was in that batch. And it was it was uh, Neil Gaiman going like, you know, dreams dreams are scary. What what would this guy do if he had total control of people, right? And then so it was as I was reading this, I was like, is this the same Doctor um, Destiny? Now you got me calling him Doctor Density, so thanks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's right at the forefront of my brain. All right, George McFly, tell us about yes. Doctor Density. Yes, so. Um, uh, <laughs> I was going to make another joke, but I'm going to keep going on. Uh, but yeah, and turns out they are kind of one and the same in that Sandman way where I think, does Constantine show up in Sandman? I think so. Uh, yeah. In that way that you had some crossover of these characters, but no. So uh, Dr. Destiny's thing is that he has the dream stone and it essentially allows him to make dreams into a reality. Um, and that's how he fights the Justice League. And of course he, you know, back in the Silver Age, it was for, you know, robbing banks and doing all this other stuff. And as we got to more modern times, it started to take on more, you know, serious kind of tones. Yeah. Of what, what could a guy do bringing dreams into reality? Right, Writers um, started seeing what they could do and say mm -hmm. with it rather than just it being a fun, gimmicky, right. know, super villain thing. Yeah. And so so here we, we find that uh, Dr. Destiny is in Arkham Tower getting treatment. But then uh, his, his dead body also shows up uh, where at in the Hall of Justice. Is it the Hall of Justice, right? Uh, and then so there's there's a mystery of foot that the Justice League has to get together. Yeah, the, um, the, the issue starts with like, a, effectively, we don't realize who it is at first. We just see like some guy's dreaming. Uh, uh -huh. He's with a woman at a picnic and she calls him John. And I'm like, okay, what's the John? Who's the John? Yep. Um, and then it turns into this horrible nightmare. And it turns out that the villain of this story, Insomnia, who we don't get his name until much later, but right. he is messing with Dr. Destiny because he wants the nightmare stone. Not the dream mm -hmm. stone, right? Which right. we've already established. Apparently there's something mm -hmm. worse. There's something called the nightmare stone. That, yeah, that Dr. Destiny hid in the nightmares or in the dream? No, nightmares. Uh, He's had it somewhere in the nightmares right. of one of the yeah. DC Universe's right. superheroes, but he doesn't mm -hmm. know, like, Insomnia which. doesn't know which one it is. He doesn't know which hero has right. this in their nightmares. And, and that's why he's plunged all the heroes into nightmare land, because he wants to right. find it somehow. 
yeah, bringing nightmares into reality and and all of that stuff, um, which I, I do think is a nice little hook. Although it, it is Rika Williamson doing the, oh, well, there's a dream stone. What if there's a nightmare stone? You know, it, um, it, it, it's got a little of that. I will say the actual mm-hmm. framing device of this isn't mm-hmm. too bad. Like no, the idea that a character like Doctor Destiny. Destiny. I said it first, man. <laughs> I know. Well, I thought you were gonna say density, uh, so I was trying to bail you out. Um, if I say density, it's on purpose. All right, yes. <laughs> I made that very clear right now. No, so a character like Doctor Destiny hiding something in the dreams of one of the heroes because it's so severe that no one can have access to it, mm-hmm. and we've got this character who's look, looking for it. It's kind of you. It's kind of cool. I will say mm-hmm. though, the insomnia as a character so far, based on this issue, he feels a lot more lighter and hijinksy than a character that mm-hmm. I'm scared of. That's like looking for like, the ultimate evil MacGuffin, you know? Right. Yeah. And maybe that's by design. Maybe he he wants because it is nightmare, right? So you need to balance out some of the horrific he, stuff with yeah, a bit of a lighter. He feels more like he's got like a punk rock Loki kind of like mm-hmm. tone to him, rather than like oh he's like this eminent like all-encompassing threat that is we should right. be dreading he feels a bit more wisecracky and i actually do think that's a disservice to like the the fear that they're trying to build mm-hmm. up because if we're, if we're doing a story called night terrors and it's all beginning in nightmares and about mm-hmm. what could happen if this bad guy gets his hands on this nightmare stone yeah you know do you do you think that williamson's a little bit too influenced by late stage freddy and that's why he's the kind of wisecracking because early on freddy is you know, menacing, especially in that first yeah. movie. Do you know, I wasn't uh, even really thinking about uh, Freddy as I was reading this, although obviously, mm-hmm. you know, it's kind of clear why you would, to be honest. Yeah. Um. Uh, yeah, I guess maybe, maybe like, it, it feels like the wrong choice to me, I think, ultimately. Mm-hmm. Uh, so one of the, the main characters that's introduced in here, of course, is Dead Man, who is going to be mm-hmm. fundamental. We sort of start the story after the opening like Nightmare Tease. We get mm-hmm. the story from his perspective where he's sensing some sort of dark presence around some of the Justice League mm-hmm. members and follows Superman back to the Hall of Justice mm-hmm. and notices that Wonder Woman has the same dark presence around her and then the Batman mm-hmm. has the same dark presence around him. So yeah. they find what appears to be Dr. Destiny's dead body in the basement of the Hall of Justice. But when Batman calls Arkham Tower and Harley's there, she's like, no, Dr. Destiny's here and he's kind of freaking out. There's something going on. Mm -hmm. And it turns out this body in the Hall of Justice is made of nightmare energy, Mm -hmm. which it's a bit bit just... It's a a bit comic book. You just throw a word at a wall. Yeah, Speed Force Bro type of stuff. Yeah, yeah. uh, Which, again, is fine. In because it gets the point across that this is almost like an astral form, uh, and this is kind of the what the nightmares are going to take form shape from going forward. Because I'm I'm still trying to get heads or tails of are all these nightmares happening in the same realm, or are these individualized like each of the books that we read? Right. So like when you get to the Night Terrors Batman, is that going on in the same realm as you know? Black Adams or or Ravagers, or are they unique to their dreams? You know, kind of Inception style. I would say because they specifically point out in the other books that the nightmares themselves are coming from mm-hmm. the person who's dreaming. Like it's their own like past mm-hmm. and psychology that are forming the dreams. Right. It's, it's not insomnia or something else that's doing that as mm-hmm. a person. So at the very least, it feels that like they're all in their own bubbles. Maybe there's connections. Like maybe there's like. Maybe if they sort of break out of their bubble, maybe they can walk into yeah. someone else's nightmare. Maybe it's all connected in a plane like that. Mm-hmm. But it does feel like in the, the dream itself, it is its own self-contained. Because right. they're creating everything that's in there, effectively, subconsciously. Right. Right, right, right. So I'm just trying to make heads or tails of what the this astral form, the nightmare energy, like, what is it then? You know, how is it manifesting in, in reality? You know, is, is it going to take time? It's just because Dr. Destiny had so much, you know, experience with the Dreamstone, that that's why, you know, kind of deal. But I, I mean, I, I think as a storytelling device, it works though, because it sets up that mystery of, of why, why is this here? Why is he there? You know, he's having the waking nightmare, having like convulsions. Like that, that was actually kind of the art there. Cause Howard Porter, I would say here, I tend to like his flash stuff, even though it comes across a little blocky. 
Uh, some of the stuff in here was real, you know, miss more than hit. But I felt like this, right, this scene with Dr. Destiny's, you know, astral self in the basement of the Justice, well, uh, Hall of Justice was I think good. Howard Porter stuff leans itself to the horror. So when they're actually in nightmares, mm -hmm. his art actually fits yes. quite well with that because it's kind of contorted. The problem is, is that a lot of his regular world art just looks as contorted and just as, yep. like, scratchy and stuff. And that feels like it isn't quite right for, like, you know, seeing, like, Batman and Wonder Woman just having a chat. Mm -hmm. But... You know, I, I will say on, on like what's going on with Doctor Destiny, I don't think it's as mysterious as is mm -hmm. that. I, I think it's clear that whatever's happened to him here is because insomnia has been like grilling him like subconsciously mm -hmm. for the answers that he wants, and right. clearly he's got out the answer of like it's trapped in one of the the superheroes' nightmares, and mm -hmm. that's you know leading to like what he's doing now. Um, so. Dead man realizes this something bad's coming from all this, and he he just he hijacks Batman to tell them and warn them. Which I, I did love that. <laughs> yeah, uh, ba Batman's not too pleased by this. No. <laughs> um, Amanda Waller's you know obviously keeping tabs on things as well. Mm -hmm. She's got like someone there watching the 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 Justice League. Um, so that's something to set up for later as well, mm -hmm. I presume. Um, but yeah, the the by the end of the issue though, um the entire world seemingly has been plunged to sleep. Like, everyone mm -hmm. seems to be falling asleep um, because of whatever Insomnia is doing. He's releasing, I don't know. I mean, he's called Insomnia, I guess. He's, right. he's, he's sucking all the insomnia out of the planet so everyone yeah, goes to sleep. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, for someone that wants you to go to sleep, it's kind of ironic that he's named for, you know, the state of mind that keeps you from falling asleep. So, you know... Uh, that's, a, that's a weird thing. But yeah, but, but I, 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 he gets I, the point across. I do like that Batman lasts a little bit longer though, because he pops mm -hmm. adrenaline pills to try and stay awake, and he's like, "No, yeah. I will not fall asleep on the <laughs> goddamn like, Batman." I'm gonna, some, <laughs> I'm gonna do some drugs right now, and somebody goes, "Oh, that's cute." Because uh, <laughs> Superman's falling asleep in the sky, we see all the other heroes falling asleep. Um, yeah, it's a whole thing. Um, back, back with the Dead Man's introduction, I do like that we do get like his thoughts on each of the Trinity. I thought that was a nice little storytelling thing. Cause I do feel like dead man's going to be the, the main hero in all of this. And I feel like he's going to be our through line. So to see him in kind of his reverence for these three and what they each, what each of them bring to the team atmosphere and something that he, well, you know, when we end the he, issue, he actually takes Batman's body back again. Mm -hmm. Batman's asleep and he's in his nightmare, but Boston right. is controlling his body to try right. and do something in the real world. So I presume that's going to be a big factor in the main yeah. four part series is, is right. Boston trying to save the day in Batman's body. Uh, right. But we'll see, see where they go with that. I, I do like, I don't think this is actually too bad an issue. Mm. Um, I, I do think there's some dialogue quirks here or there. There's little moments where just dialogue between like what the Trinity just feel a little yeah. bit stilted and just feel a little bit almost like like Williamson's going for like a silver agey kind of vibe with how they talk mm -hmm. to each other, and it feels a bit weird, especially when it's like mixed in with them referencing like what oh. just happened in Batman and like, hey yeah. Batman, you just got back from that other dimension after you fought failsafe. Yeah, I made I made that note too in my head about like. Eh. It's a little bit him going the extra mile when he didn't need to mention that type of stuff. You know, he could have just left it uh, there. But I always thought that Williamson's Batman has a weird voice anyways. Like, I felt that when he was writing the Batman book. His Bruce is kind of a little bit too gruff. And here he comes off really, really gruff. You know, and when he's talking to his, you know, two closest friends, maybe, maybe it doesn't need to be like that. But, you know, I didn't, I didn't feel that got in the way of the story as much as the them bringing in the events of, of the main Batman book. Uh, yeah, there was a, wasn't there a moment, I, I think it was this issue, I may be mixing it up with the, the Batman mm -hmm. issue, where yeah. Batman says, I can't kill you, Boston, but if you do that again, I'll, I'll make you see the light or walk into the light. Uh -huh. I thought that was like a weird death threat to come from Batman. Yeah. Even I know it's technically not, but it still felt weird for him to say that. Yeah. I don't know. I, I just I I don't know how to I don't know how to edit that though to make it sound like a, a funny like because how else would Bruce threaten Boston Brain? You know. Yeah. No. I mean, you can read it as just, but I just I, I feel like because Bruce is so stingy on the no killing. Yeah. He just he never even jokes about it. He never like threatens <laughs> to kill someone. I mean, you can't kill a ghost. You know. <laughs> so I mean, what are you going to kill him more? Uh, I mean, Frighteners taught us that you can kill ghosts. So there's a whole other level to that, but there's no Frighteners at play here. So, 
but but no stop um, bringing up I, mediocre movies this episode Matt. <laughs> it's another movie i really enjoy probably my favorite peter jackson movie uh wait frighteners or lord of the rings you have to watch one right now is frighteners the theatrical cut or the director's cut well whatever your your choice well, the theatrical cut of Frighteners is the shortest out of all the options, so I'll go with that. <laughs> all right. All right, the extended cut. Uh, is it just one Lord of the Rings movie? Yes, just a Lord of the Rings. Wait, what's your least favorite? Oh, two Towers, probably. Okay, so you have to watch Two Towers or the Frighteners extended cut. <sighs> wow, I didn't think this was going to be that big of a decision. I thought you would have gone Frighteners 100%. Probably because it's a later watch, but I mean, I'm yeah. not happy about it. <laughs> like, I'm definitely not happy about it. Uh, so, but yeah, um, back back to Night Terrors. Um, uh, the art again, I thought it really to the back end of the the book, it started really coming. Well, to it's its because own. we're in like nightmares at that the point. We're actually, yeah. we're actually in like otherworldly stuff, and that's where I think right. Porter's art really sort of works. Uh, so when Bruce finally falls asleep, um, when uh -huh. he, he can't stay awake no more, and you see you got that close up of his heart kind of like thumping mm -hmm. and he finally goes down um when he sort of i shouldn't say wakes up because that's got <laughs> but when Wait. he when he becomes aware that he's in a nightmare um he is a young boy and he looks at his tie and he says i recognize this tie i was wearing this the night and i went oh no we're in the alley we're in the alley where the wounds are going to die um more than that in the batman issue but i i might have yelled i'm out which led <laughs> Which led my wife to go, what are you, what are you yelling about right now? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's 930 at night. Why are you yelling? Um, but yeah, which we, I kind of knew because of the cover of, of the Batman book, but I didn't think we we're going to get into it here. So, um, but yeah, as long as I don't have to watch Krypton explode if, when we get to Superman's. <laughs> I think I'll be okay. Place it's time your, to do that again. Place your bets, everyone. Place your yeah. bets now, because there's a good chance you might. Um, <sighs> I think that's that. That was part of why I was so on, like dreading this this like crossover event yeah. thing, is because I just know that so many of the nightmares, and it's fine for some of the smaller characters who mm -hmm. we don't get to explore as much. But with Batman and Superman, it's like we have we have talked about like, their core defining things in their past so much yeah. that hearing bruce whine about his parents or superman whine about krypton is just something like we're, we're, we're so yeah. over it now we're so we're so far past yeah. wanting to hear about it yeah well and that's why i feel like with some of the smaller books it uh, i don't say that i maybe enjoyed it more because of that but those characters have different things that it's not their core to their belief like oh you know when we get to ravager there's something in there that's kind of key to who rose is but the way that they bring it up, it's not typical. It's not like, oh, Rose and her daddy issues again, you know? Um, well, because I feel like there's a way that you can turn like the crime alley stuff into Bruce's nightmare. Because right, that's what formed him into Batman. I just don't want to see him as a child again, you know? Like, ugh. I mean, no, I, like I get the impulse to do it. If you're going to have mm -hmm. like, what, what, what is, what is his nightmare? What does he relive yeah. in his head? Obviously, it's that, but. At that right. point, I'm like, just don't do that story. Don't do the story where we have to see it again. True. Like, I'm just done True. with it. Uh, just don't, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so Bruce is asleep like everyone else. He's in his nightmare. And the final couple pages is Boston taking control of Batman's body. And in the last page, Insomnia has him by the neck um, and specifically says, and I'm going to make the heroes pay for what they did to me. So that makes me think that Insomnia is an alias for someone else who... Yeah they'll reveal who it is later maybe or there's going to be a lot of big like retcon backstory about who insomnia is in his history with the justice league if i if i had to bet that the, we're getting the williamson treatment and that's mm. what it's going to be it's going to be you know new character that was introduced however they were in the background the whole time i kind of uh, like see if he does that though i'm going to be annoyed wouldn't it just be more interesting to say there's a new character on the scene and we're going mm -hmm. to discover who he is in real time as he's I, enacting his plan because he's that dangerous yeah being being that he's you know pulling from from like this this new era you you would assume like where the justice society is around and whatnot because that's the status quo of dc like tying him into sand and and sandman wesley dodds i wouldn't mind something like that you know, something that ties insomnia into that, you know, aspect of the dream realm. Um, I just hope that, you know, 
Also, I'm not that well versed in the you know the the dream version, the Morpheus Sandman from from Guy or Gaiman. So I'm just hoping that it's nothing to do with that either, right? Because I kind of like when stuff can be compartmentalized. So I mean, my uh, my thing here is that it's kind of a double edged sword for me because on the one hand, he's either so so it's saying here at the end are going to make the Just League pay or make the heroes pay for mm -hmm. what they did to me, which mm -hmm. would suggest there's going to be a retcon like sort of insertion of this character into the timeline, mm -hmm. or maybe he'll turn out to be someone else uh, who's in disguise. But either yeah. way, you're you're trying to like feed in that he's more important and on a personal level be right. because he's already tied to the past, and I hate that as a writing mechanic. Or um, if you make him new, there is maybe still an issue where okay, by tying him and introducing him with Dr. Destiny, and uh -huh. you're kind of doing that, like, boring escalation thing, where, like, he's like Dr. Destiny, but he's even worse because he, he took yeah. out Dr. Destiny, and he's like, the, the, you know, it's, it's that, like, oh, we had a villain who tried to destroy Earth, so next time it'll be a villain who tries to destroy the, the entire galaxy kind the of thing. The universe, yeah. You know? um, yeah, like you said, escalation. So. And, and, and both are a bit... Like whatever. That said, if I had to pick between the two, I'll take the escalation one over yeah. the oh, this is someone who's important from their past that we've never talked uh, about before. I don't want the ghost maker bullshit. Okay, I, yeah, I never want the ghost maker bullshit. That's what I'm worried about. I don't. Yeah, I'm tired of that. Like we've gotten that so much. Once or twice, I think it's fine, but we, that happens. Like it was all over his flash run, right? So yeah, I, and this is the thing. Like you know, the first couple issues of Dark Crisis, we were relatively mm -hmm. positive, yep. but by the time we got to the end, just like uh, Infinite Frontier, just like yeah. whatever other one was in between those, they all <laughs> fluffed. They all like they all had decent okay. ideas, but kind of fell apart the the more they went on. So right now, my expectation is to be talking about why this is bad in about a month and a half's time. <laughs> You know what? All he has to do is say that Insomnia came from Darkseid's crack and I'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, Darkseid's crack can give me Insomnia too. I'm just saying. It's probably craggly. Dude needs to moisturize. I just... Uh, yeah. There's, there's some good... There's some I, good ideas in here. Like, But that's, mm -hmm. again, that's typical for Williamson starting a, 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 an event. It tends to be as they go on, where how he actually tries to make it all come together that I can totally start to lose yeah. interest. I was, and it's probably because I had lower expectations for this, but I was surprised with how much I enjoyed this issue. You know, so uh, if he can just keep surprising me, I'm just getting my expectations low. Uh, honestly, yeah, yeah, this issue on its own is a pretty solid to decent mm -hmm. uh, event first issue. Right. Yeah. For 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 that on that metrics, it's completely fine, if not quite enjoyable. But I've read enough Williamson now. I've read enough mini series and events it's, by it's Williamson the, that I just it's a sense of dread that we're waiting for the other shoe to drop. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then and there's definitely some red flags. You know that line in the last page of like they're going to pay for what they did to me. Uh -huh. That to me, especially for Williamson, is a red flag at this point. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll see. Well, and that gets me my brain going like, who could this be? And I don't know if I. I'm trying to break myself of that, you know, I'm just trying to take the story and not have to do the, you know, big amount of research, you know, but because it could literally be anybody or it could be nobody. And then I've just wasted time. So I'm just trying to get better at letting stuff sit, you know, but John's kind of broke my brain when it came to that stuff because he was so good at pulling stuff from old stories that was just like a line, you know, like his entire Green Lantern run. You know, he, he built from, from stuff from the Alan Moore stuff. But, you well, know, but we've, yeah, we've talked many times about Williamson trying to do what Johns does and right. just not being good at it, sadly. Right. So, so here that we said, are. Uh, ending on, on more of a positive note that I did, you know, I was surprised with how much I enjoyed this because I did set myself up for, like, oh, no, it's Night Terrors. It's finally here. And I was like, oh, the first issue was actually kind of fun. It's the sort of thing where. I think my, my dreading of this two months was more because of just all of the tie-ins rather than mm -hmm. the main series itself. Um, yeah. Even though I, I do have my, you know, reservations on it. I Like, I think... Well, even if the main five-issue book is great, if, if, if it feels... If I feel... If I'm still annoyed in two months' time that all my regular books stopped for all these tie-ins... Like, you know, that'll still be an issue, but, you know, we're here at the start. We'll talk about the first batch of tie-ins, uh, obviously, over the course of the next four issues. But 
Uh, I mean, yeah, first blood. Yeah, honestly, it's a solid enough event intro. Like, I, mm -hmm. I don't have anything too mm -mm. bad to say about it. I think Howard Porter's art is is it's right for some of the scenes, but it's not quite not right all. for the other scenes. It, it really would have benefited from two artists doing the first half and the back half. Like uh, once the nightmare stuff started, you know. This is oh. where a, a two artist, I think, would have helped. It's not a clear split, though, because the opening scene is also a nightmare. So I, I, I think, mm -hmm. you know, but it's very rare we say that we recommend two artists. And I right. think here it might have actually been the right call for this yeah. book. And it is an oversized book as well, so it probably would have made life easier. On Porter. Right, because he, he's on the main book too, right? Is, uh, it, is it Porter? I can't remember. I think so. I'm going to look. I can't remember. All right, Matt, what are you rating? I'm going to give this a solid 7. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think a 7 out of 10 is completely fair for this. Um, you know, I, I would say everyone keep your expectations low. <laughs> and maybe there'll be some fun to be had. Yeah. Keep uh, your, your heads up high and expectations down low. Yeah. Uh, all right. Night Terrors, Batman issue 1, Joshua Wilson writing with Gillum March on our... So, here's the thing. I, you know, the, the, the end of First Blood kind of implied some of where we were going uh, with this. Mm -hmm. um, and this issue, it has a little thing in the past where Batman was trying to condition himself to get over his fears by getting into a tank and just being, <laughs> like, plagued by nightmares for 24 hours. I, yeah, which, like, it was a... Again, sensory deprivation and stuff being what it is. However, I just... It really reeks of because Batman. Um, I, I did love that the Alfred's kind of like, I don't think this is the best course of astro, uh, action, Master Bruce. You know? And of but course yeah. he's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. But then we cut ahead to the nightmare that we left off in, in First Blood. So he's, he's, you know, he's young Bruce Wayne. He's still mm -hmm. talking like, you know, old Bruce. He's still saying, mm -hmm. hey, I'm in a nightmare. I have to get out of here. And all the rest of it. So... In the first part, when he's in the deprivation tank, and we get some like sort of quick little panels, and I saw the mm -hmm. pearls falling and stuff, I was like rolling my eyes. I'm like, okay, it's a little montage, whatever, right? When it gets to the main nightmare part, when I turned the page and I saw the nightmare turn into giant pearls like coming down at Bruce, and he has to start running and dodging out the way of these giant pearls dropping, I started pissing myself laughing. I could not think this was funnier. I'm, I'm glad you thought it was funny because it made me angry. And then now I'm I... I'm convinced that Williamson listens to us because he's like, what can we do that's going to piss Matt off? Well, that, oh, that's, why giant I thought, pearls. that's why I thought it was funny, though, because we always talk about never want to see the pearls fall again. And all I could think was this page, this panel even of him looking up at all these pearls coming down at him. This is what it feels like whenever I'm reading one of those pages is I feel like I can't dodge the goddamn pearls. Yep. So I, I laughed hysterically. It's not even maybe the funniest thing in this issue. But... No. And I was tipped off for that by one of the guys that works at my shop, uh, who's a big Batman fan. He's like, well, I finally have seen the worst Batman thing I ever have. And I was like, well, are you reading tech? Because that'll wash it out. And he's behind. So he's going to get caught up so we can talk about good Batman stuff. Uh, and, and yeah. But I, I believe you're talking about the demon thing that comes out. Well, uh, yeah, he'll skip ahead a little bit. Uh, well, I, we'll, we'll go through an order. So so <sighs> after he judges the pearls, he runs into the theater that he was in with his parents. Mm -hmm. um, and then on the screen, he say he sees some of the real world. So he sees that Boston's in his body. And he, right. think, he thinks it's Dead Man's fault that he can't like wake up. Because, oh, Boston, you've taken my body. Right. So now I can't wake up. Which I don't think is true. I think that's just Bruce trying to reason with himself. Yeah, because, well, yeah, Bruce always has to have control. So he's going to yeah. blame, you know, yeah. yeah. Boston's trying to save the day. And uh, Bruce is you know out of his depth a little bit but he ends up seeing a bunch of gravestones for everyone that he cares about you know mm -hmm. typical nightmare stuff and then insomnia shows up dressed as a robin although he's got an i instead of a, an r right yeah, and insomnia and he's got purple hair so he's going for kind of a almost jokery sort of mm -hmm. color scheme here um and it's during this scene when he starts raising all of like Bruce's loved ones, including Martha Wayne, who's wearing pearls again. There's so many pearls in this issue, Matt. So many pearls. Too many Cheers. pearls. Uh, and then there's a dead Selina talking to him. So everyone he cares about is dead. And then young Bruce throws up something huge. It turns out to be a giant bat creature. But when the bat is all curled up and when it unravels and the wings come out, 
It's a giant bat, but its head is a gun. <laughs> and at this point, we're just doing straight up. Like, I, I don't even want to disrespect David Lynch by saying this is David no. Lynch because it's not. No, but no, because David Lynch, there would be a reason for the gun bat that is that you know. <sighs> It's not just a bat with a gun on its head because Batman hates guns but loves bats. Like, it's just... Yeah. It, it, it isn't Lynchian because I don't think David Lynch would even try anything like that. It would be like a deformed bat, you know? Like... Well... Uh, like, I think there's a way to present just about any idea. But... I just, I, I don't think that I, I was getting, like, the, the right sense of, like, ethereal quality from this that when, I needed to, like, the state I need to be in to appreciate yeah. something this ridiculous as a concept, um, it just kind of comes out of nowhere, and then it sort of shifts into the next part of the nightmare, uh, eventually, where Bruce is actually in Joe Chill's body, and he can't stop himself from uh, shooting his own parents. I, Which, once I, again, can I point out, Martha Wayne's on that page, in the, the final page of this issue, and there yep. she is again, wearing the goddamn pearls. <laughs> yep. Which, I do like that turn, because that is a that is a nightmare like that Bruce is going through, that now, because he feels so responsible for walking through Crime Alley, that he's now in the, ro- the, the role, now in, in the, yeah, the role of, of Joe Chill. A yeah, yeah. Obviously, yeah. It uh, means he, he blames himself. He sees himself yeah. as responsible for doing it. So now and, he's actually imagining himself being the one who pulled the trigger. Yeah. And so I, I don't hate that as a, as a nightmare for Bruce, you know. Uh, but yeah, again, like you said, just don't tell that story then. Like this is well hallowed, you know, worn hallowed ground that we just I don't need to be in Crime Alley ever again. That, that that's the thing like the entire concept means you have to do this with bruce because there's otherwise there's nothing else to do with them but it's yeah it's just frustrating honestly i just can't get over the the count of perils I, i'm not going to do it but yeah this might have the highest peril count if you count every individual peril in this issue it may be the highest of any batman comic that's ever been published yeah. i shit you not and again i feel like williamson has to be taking the piss out of us because these, like, it's not just us either, right? When I say us, I mean the fans, not just our show. Like, the number of people that I run to run into online that are also tired of this stuff, you know? I want um, someone to work out the average PPP of this issue, and that's it. <laughs> Perils per page, right? Triple P. <laughs> right? Because yeah. I, I guarantee you the average on this yeah. issue is, is through um, the roof. Yeah, and just the, the, the bat with a gun for a head. That's something like a kindergartner draws you know like i don't, well, I, know. I don't know about that but it's definitely do, do you know the problem with it is it, it's it's trying to go for it's trying to go for cronenberg right yeah i, I brought up david lynch but the director i should have brought up was cronenberg it's cronenberg it, yeah it, i didn't want to correct you it's trying but... to go for a video drummy body horror style mm-hmm. thing and it works in the context of cronenberg stories i think the problem here is that up until this point in the issue like, okay, we got the giant pearls, but it kind of feels... I don't know. I, I guess it just... It all feels a bit trite, I guess. I, I guess that's my complaint, is that I'm just kind of cynical about, like, the writing of this issue, so that when that comes, it's just kind of tipping me over the edge into more hilarity. So, yeah. I will say this. I was constantly laughing at this issue. Yes. That's something. There was entertainment yeah. to be had, but not for the right reasons, I would say. Nope. And, and when my comic book guy tipped me off, he goes, there's a bat with a gun for a head. And that's what made me, I was like, well, in Detective, you have Barbados, but he doesn't have a gun for his head. <laughs> like, he, there's a bat team in... It feels, do you know what it feels like? You know? It feels like... Um, I'm, I'm going to st- steal a line from, uh, yeah. from Tara and the Ace here, but it feels like babies for psychological uh, yeah. deconstruction, where, like... I can see what Williams is trying to poke at and what he wants to do with this, but it doesn't feel like someone who has any experience of actually doing like a right. an off kilter psychological story where the rules of reality don't quite apply, and the results are all feel a little bit kind of like this is what an edgy teenager would think would be a cool mm-hmm. like visual to like show what Bruce feels or something. Like, I don't know. It all just feels a bit lame. Is it the best word? Yeah. You're right. It's the oh my god, this is so edgy. 
And it's like, you know, like him showing up with the, the, like I get the Robin again. There's a lot of iconography that makes sense for Batman's nightmares, right? He, he you know, he lost Jason. He's lost other Robins. Okay, so that's why is the, is the 70 Brown stuff still canon at this point? Was she Robin? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. Um, I'm going to say so, probably just because everything seems to be canon from that era now. Okay. So, I mean, at that point, then if, if Damien still, uh, if his death is still, you know, in, in play, you know, he's, he's lost a couple Robins. So I get like insomnia appearing as, you know, Bruce's biggest failure. And then, of course, Bruce worrying about losing the rest of his family like he lost his parents. Yeah. Well, I don't know if it was that, this or if it was the, the first blood issue, but in one of them he uh, says, what if I kill all your Robins so I can be your new psychic? Which, yeah. you know, whatever. That's, that's fine. Yeah. yeah. So, I'm using but, but yeah, but like I get that iconography at play here for Bruce's, you know, it or, you know, I, I don't know the, the, the brain states or the personality stuff like uh, and all that, but you know, his, his deepest, darkest fear is, is losing those that he holds close. So all of that stuff in the graveyard, I thought was really well done too. Even, even with the bat and cat stuff, when, when Selena shows up too, it's just, you know, but then it just, it gets a straight up silly with, you know, the gigantic pearls and, and, and bat gun. We got to come up with a name with this thing now. Like, uh, I'm trying to think of, of what we could call this thing. Uh, 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 Batretta. Bat. That's not bad. That's not bad. The Batretta. <laughs> I don't you know. know. Was that it's a bat clock or something? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> bat clock. Uh, I, I, it's. Um, but like, yeah. So, if, like, I'll say this right. Any idea. Even though here it feels really stupid and we're making fun of it, I don't doubt that there's some writers and artists who can make this concept work. Mm -hmm. There is there is the right approach to just about any idea. And mm -hmm. I think one of the things that is becoming more clear the longer I've read comics and the longer I've read specifically Batman and Superman and these characters that have been around for so goddamn long is that there are just certain things that it's been done to death enough that, it, that unless you are just like making something exceptional that is so well told in its craft mm -hmm. that I'm going to not care because it's just so engrossing, a lot of things are just going to immediately turn me off. And one of them is we're doing Bruce dreaming he's in the alleyway, the pearls falling, and all that nonsense. Yeah. You know, even like you go back and play Batman Arkham Asylum and the, the scarecrow grass hits you, you turn into little Bruce Wayne and you're walking down the alleyway and you hear the gunshot and it's fine i get why that's the choice but you know that was 14 years ago now and right. i feel like i've seen variations of that idea done so many times at this point that mm -hmm. um unless you are doing something special okay kind of like how we're talking about how like you know how tom king's doing the first batman mm -hmm. joker in interaction yeah the craft is just so good that there's the, the question of being sick of the joker doesn't even come into it because everything's just no. so well done it doesn't yeah. matter um but here the, the the storytelling itself is just very typical comic booky so yeah. i need kind of better or newer ideas or at least ideas yeah. that i'm not so sick of anyway yeah and, but here's the thing this was so silly and, and stupid i need to see where it goes and like <laughs> fool me once shame on on you fool me twice they don't get fooled again right i'm walking right into this but i need to know you know where where this is going for part two now so well, uh, it's easy to say, yeah, I'll see where it goes, but there's only one more issue, technically, of, of this. Yeah. It's only a two-part, oh, yeah. so... This, this was a, if this is a five-issue miniseries, I'm going, <laughs> no. But for, for another issue, why not? Like, I'm not reading Batman regular right now, either. So, I have, I have a space for this. Uh, okay, because it's, yeah. it's not on for two months. This is That's here what instead. I need. So, like, <laughs> yeah. Like, because it wasn't... It wasn't that bad where it was like ugh it was like what the hell am i reading <laughs> like it, it, yeah it was at least crazy enough that i, I yeah. got some entertainment out of it yeah. but it's not not for the right reasons per se no no uh yeah there's a backup as well actually because i guess because batman yes. usually has a backup batman mm -hmm. night terrors also has a backup uh it's basically damien he got a hint of night terrors coming from before and he's he's went looking to this uh, master of sleeping dreams uh, right. to try and like see what the threat is, and this 
guy. He's like, ah, you're just as annoying as your grandfather because he's, you uh-huh. know, Raj Al Ghul tried to, you know, conquer all these things and mm-hmm. he couldn't quite do it. Uh, but uh, Damien straight up, like, opens a scroll that looks like mm-hmm. it's ancient, but it clearly has insomnia holding dead man by the neck. Yeah. Uh, so that seemingly will be a tease with, where, where we're going later. Roz, right? That's Roz with him, too. Uh, Is that it? Yeah, it looks like it, right? No, no, no. So- that's insomnia. That's insomnia? Okay, hold on. Yeah, that's what he looks like in the he's got He's got the darkness around his eyes and his hair sort of slick Okay. Back. Yeah, that's, that's insomnia for sure. Gotcha. Now, who the skeleton is in the middle, if anyone's specific? Right. I'm not sure, but, uh, yeah. Uh, so... Yeah, and this is right right when Batman's call went out about uh, all the Night Terror stuff happening mm-hmm. in First Blood. So we hear that from Damien's perspective. And then he falls asleep. Or, yeah. Um, well, because, yeah, the, the guy flips over this... Um, flips over the, the hourglass, right? Yeah. To, to learn how to do. So there's also the hourglass in that in that thing. So there, time is of the essence here for, for Damien to figure this out. Um, but no, so I think that skull is meant to be the Nightmare Stone. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, but then Damien seemingly gets back up and says that he's worked so he can stay awake and mm-hmm. he remembers his nightmare. Uh, so, like, I can almost see there been a twist in this backup that he's not really awake, he just thinks he is. Yeah. But that seems to be, at least be what he thinks right now. So yeah, and maybe he is. is. But this is only a backup in a two-part story, so, right. you know, it's not... I mean... Well, now, well, that said, though, uh, it does say to be continued in Night Terrors 3, which is a really <laughs> weird thing to read when issue one's not even out. <laughs> yep. But I guess that's where Damien's going to come swooping Pop in. Pop in, yeah. yeah. And this was a continuation of the Free Comic Day story, which I barely remembered. Oh, yeah, that's that's where the Nightmares yeah. tease came from, yeah, yeah. Yep. So, but, um, but it was interesting. I mean, I like when Williamson writes uh, Damien. Um, but, yeah, so I, th- I feel like there wasn't much to go off of, though. Just that... The appearance nah. of the scroll, you know, that that's the big thing here. Uh, the scroll and just the idea that Damien's kind of, like, being proactive, mm-hmm. and that's that's yeah. basically it. Uh, the art's yeah. very cartoony. It kind of fits Damien and his mm-hmm. usefulness. Um, the art's by... Because this is still Williamson writing this back up. Uh, yep. The art's by David Lafayette, so... Uh, yeah. Yeah. All right, well, there you go. That's yeah. Night Terror's Batman. What are you rating it, Matt? Oh, <laughs> uh, that's a 5.5. 5. Hmm... Yeah, I don't know what to rate this because all of the fun I had was because of how laughably stupid it was. was. Uh, yeah. uh, and it was Gil and Mar- Yeah, okay, I'm going to go like a four. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. I'm like, oh yeah, I need to think about the art again. I'm like, yeah. Uh, so, there you go. Night Terrors Batman. Uh, Night Terrors Poison Ivy Issue 1, G. Willow Wilson and Atagoon Ilhan on the art. Yeah, close, close enough. I did my best. You read it, Matt. Yeah, so this opens with uh, Ivy at her new place in Slaughter Swamp, and she's almost having anxiety around, like, settling down because she's like, I, this is never where I thought I would find myself, you know, living with my girlfriend, you know, I'll, I'll be in a swamp, you know, but surrounded by nature, and there's this frog that, that hops up onto, uh, you know, onto the, the deck, which, you know, She's like, something doesn't feel right. So she goes and, and she lays down, and that's when the, the night terror wave hits. And she wakes up in, like, this idyllic suburbia. And the sun's shining, but, like, the sun has this really looking, like, almost like, you know, the, the face in the moon they'd put on. It's kind of like that, but it's very sinister looking. Um, and Ivy uh, walks into, you know, this house in... Harley's there, all all dressed up, you know, telling her you're just in time for pie. Um, and in this, G. Willow Wilson uses the whole nightmare to this whole night terrors, the stuff and Ivy's nightmare as her fear about settling down and, and not being, you know, poison Ivy. And so throughout this, it's it's Harley being like, oh, you know, welcome home. This is your dream house. This is what you've always wanted. And, you know, as she is sitting down and she has this big cake and it's shaped like, you know, Harley and Ivy, you know, it's a whole lot of stuff, you know, uh, but dream logic, right? She cuts into it and there's, you know, eyeballs and stuff sticking out um, just to give you enough that it's not quite right. 
Um, but living next door is, is Batman behind this white picket fence. But, you know, he's wearing khaki cargo shorts and a pink button down shirt with the cowl over it. And, you know, again, dream logic, everything's not quite. Um, and I was like, wait, what are, what are we doing? We can't. He's here. He's going to, you know, bust us up. She goes, no. You know, Harley's like, don't worry. He's our neighbor. They're always here. And she goes, what do you mean they? And Selena comes out. Uh, except she's pregnant and she has like this dead look on her in her eyes. Like she's not all there. Um, and so Ivy starts again, freaking out. Like this is not like, this is not what we thought it would be. And Ivy keeps telling her like, no, this, you know, it's a, it's a lot of repetition of, no, this is what you've always wanted. So it's whatever this force is, it's trying to lull Ivy into the sense of, of, uh, you know, to get her off of her game and just accept that this is what she wants. But uh, as this is going on, as Ivy and Harley are hosting, you know, Bruce and Selena, uh, Janet from HR, which is the the girl that's been, you know, with Pam, that Pam helped cure her cancer. And she's been along for the ride now. She is awake in Ivy's dream. And this is what made me wonder, like, what what are the the what's going on with the dreams in night terrors like are they shared is it a similar reality you know why is janet here um and no one is paying any attention to her right so she, she's trying to get people's attention and then who she ends up getting attention from this guy that looks like penguin um and you know she's like oh you know um uh what, what's going on here though they're, they're talking about you know one minute she was at the store. Now she's here. And she's like, oh, yeah, that's just... You know, he's like, yeah, welcome to the neighborhood. Uh, Nightwing's washing his car in front of the house. And um, she's like, I, I got to get to Pam. I got to find her. So she starts wandering around town until she finally comes up to their party. And Ivy sitting there uh, just, you know, chatting it up with Bruce and Selena. And as soon as Janet shows up, things take a turn. And she starts trying to tell... Uh, Ivy, she goes, there's there's something going on. Uh, I don't know what, but I shouldn't be here and you shouldn't be here. Uh, and Ivy's like, no, I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be. And as soon as Janet, you know, keeps pushing, she's like, you're the one that doesn't belong. As soon as Ivy says that, Bruce, Selena, Ivy, they all get the, that dead stare and it almost looks like honey or some type of gold stuff starts flowing out of their mouth. Um, and and uh, Ivy and Harley leave Janet with them. Um, and then uh, as Harley and Ivy are in the house, they start kissing, which you see that gold stuff start leaking from Harley. And uh, Ivy's like, well, there's something going on outside. And... Harley's like, no, don't worry about it. Focus on me. And as soon as she says that, gold stuff starts leaking from, like that honey, starts leaking from, from Ivy's face. Uh, and then the sun goes down with Ivy wondering, you know, you know, what makes it a dream house? Like, is it everything that you want? Or, you know, is it the, nor the boards and nails, the bricks foundations, or is it less physical? Is it because you're finally comfortable? And, uh... Janet's, you know, trying to get away. She runs into the penguin and everybody else. Uh, and, you know, she falls and they're standing over her looking all maniacal. And then that's where it ends. Um, the art style, not not for me. It's kind of reminiscent of Riley Rosmo in places, just without oh, the exaggerated. Well, well, you get the exaggerated features where it works, right? Where they're, you know, they're looking maniacal and they got that gold stuff flowing out of their mouth. Um and whatnot but you know like the deadpan faces there's just like nothing there you know and i know in in dream logic and all the stuff that works but i just everyone starts to look the same whether it's you know harley or selena or there's not a lot of difference in their description the only people that end up looking you know semi-regular are janet and ivy right and that's probably by design but it still doesn't help um, however, the, the story that Wilson's telling, right, of, of this person that is almost, you know, finally at peace uh, with who they are, but still having that little bit worry, like, am I doing the right thing? Is, you know, settling down 
is this what I need to be doing? You know, playing on that nightmare, it almost feels like a stress dream, right? Um, it's very effective and it fits. I feel like this is one of those ones that fits in to the story they were telling in the main Ivy book, right? So this almost feels like a next, you know, a next part that they're going to jump from. So uh, really, really enjoyed it. Uh, you know, art aside, uh, it's, it's a pretty good story. It's kind of been what Ivy's been since the beginning. Um, so I'll, I'll read this a seven. All right, cool. Uh, we got Nate Tower's Ravager issue one, Ed Brisson writing with Dexter Soy on the art. And this was, I thought, a super quick read, actually. Yep. Um, I felt like I was I was through it in no time at all, which yep. I don't even necessarily mean to critique per se, other than just I feel like if you bought a bunch of these tie ins, like a couple of them I read did go really quick, where, yeah. you know, if they're only a two part story, then I'm not sure how much of a story ultimately they'll be right. when, they're, when they're all said and done because mm -hmm. you know this story it feels like we're following a young rose kind of like we're following a young bruce and his nightmare yep. and she's scared of you know someone seemingly a father figure yep. uh but then the what appears to be like the mother figure in this like mm -hmm. scene gets ripped apart by these two monstrous creatures and oh. then a third monster like comes out of the blood of yep. her blood so it's this really monstrous thing and then he's saying come to daddy but mm -hmm. then we find out after this that regular Rose like wakes up in this nightmare and mm -hmm. she ends up coming to like fight and intervene and protect the young Rose. So we get more of like a like this seems to be like a young personification of Rose, but mm -hmm. things aren't quite the same. Like she's clearly, it's clearly scared of this father figure, but it's not Deathstroke. Like, you know, like, right. She she refers to him as the murder man. Right. Mm. And and so she's so she her name is Rose, but it's like Rose Madison or Montgomery. And it's like her foster family that, you know, she's so our Rose, our, our regular Rose Wilson is like, no, well, that's not right. I was raised in a brothel. I wasn't raised in a house. So she's trying to like herself trying to piece together what's going on here. Uh, and then when they bring up the murder man, she's like, oh, that's that's kind of familiar uh, yeah, she starts to put the pieces together. Yeah, uh, and then the reveal at the end of the issue is that the young one is also working for the bad murder man, and yeah. it was all to, to trap Rose, because Rose, and this is slightly interesting, I guess, in mm -hmm. the context of this larger thing, is that mm -hmm. this murder man seems to be a being who's trying to break out of the nightmares, separate from yeah. insomnia. This seems to be like another villain who's in here, and mm -hmm. wants to use Rose, because she's a person who exists in both worlds. Uh, right. both the nightmare world and the real world he wants to use her as a conduit to to get into the real world that that i mean conceptually that's interesting mm -hmm. it's just about as interesting as a thing you could probably do in a tie-in like this where you're like okay yeah. you've given us this greater nightmare world you're given us a character here that that might be his own threat and something for rose to deal with if mm -hmm. anything though like the, the issue is such a quick read and it's only got one more so i'm not yeah. sure how in depth it's really going to get you know well yeah because because the turn you can kind of see it coming right with the with the young rose you know when she stabs our rose uh and it's just like well no you're you you walk in two worlds i thought that was interesting too because rose mentions that uh her precog's not working right like she can't see things coming which I and guess kind of makes sense because it's not yeah. the real world, so it's not right. real future. And so, and, and that's how she gets stabbed by the younger version, right? Is that she didn't see it coming and she lets herself go. So, whoever this murder man is definitely has their eyes, you know, their it's set on Rose. I'm still, I don't know if I agree that it's like some other entity, other than I feel like it is her. To me, if this is Rose's nightmare, it's it's her not wanting to become her dad. Oh, you, know, you know? think this monster's a dark part of her psyche who wants out. I yeah, can see that. Yeah, That I'm, wants out, you know? That, that makes so, sense. So it's effectively a dark part of her psyche that's trying to right. take control and be the driver's seat. Almost yeah. like a like a Crazy Jane style, like... Kind of, yeah. It's it's that, you know, Slade aspect of herself that she's fighting so hard not yeah. to be. And so, and now the nightmare, it, it's sensing the weakness of her and, being and Slade. That would, and that would make sense yeah. with the idea of like her betraying herself to... Yep. To, to let it, to out, let it out thing yeah yeah and so that makes yeah, that makes enough sense uh there is maybe a wider implication at the end though we see in the real world that there's members of stormwatch of all things that are still yeah. awake and actually pick up rosie's sleeping body uh, because it mentioned and so i i've been out on the deathstroke book so i is because who is that 
the the guy that picks her up was the guy from Tiny Engine, right? Uh, that was the, the yeah. cop. I can't remember his name. Oh, yeah, I can't remember his name either. Yeah, I'm just gonna call him Super Cop. Uh, it was it was Super Cop, and oh no, Patri- Patriot One. Shoot, I can't remember. But yeah, and so I didn't realize she was part of Stormwatch because it made it sound like that was the team she was on. And that's why he scooped her up. Uh, but yeah, so why aren't they asleep? That That's a that's a big I don't mystery. Know. Uh, maybe he's protected in his suit because he's yeah. like, sealed up and then there's like... I'm going to have to find him. Then the others are in some sort of protective... I don't, I don't know. Like... Uh, but that's maybe peacekeeper. That's what he's peacekeeper one. There you go. Um, there we go. Yeah. But yeah, no, I liked it. I I liked this more than I thought I was going to. I mean, I I read it because I had some oh, time and I. It was like, the best. Rose. It was the best tie-in I read this week for sure because you had the the, the inner stuff mm-hmm. with Rose, which was fun to look at. Dexter saw his art mm-hmm. very good. We've not really mentioned that yet, but yeah, it's the best looking of these I think that I read. Yeah. Um, and his art too. It. He's really good at the action stuff, but here it was more of the the ambience. Mm. Like, you know, when, when the murder man comes out of the blood, you're like, oh my God, what the hell? That was, like, pretty, hor- this, that was pretty horrific, but even when yeah. Rose wakes up and she's on like, the branches of the bush or whatever it is, yeah. and there's vines, there's a lot of detail. Mm-hmm. And Dexter saw he's, kind of, he's got this really good balancing act of having a lot of detail, but also feeling like things are very clean. Mm-hmm. Um, and I felt that throughout. Uh, the coloring really plays with the shadows. Which is good. Um, and I, I think as well, this one arguably is more exciting from a greater context because, okay, we're setting up that there's some people who are still awake and that are running around trying to like wake up some of the heroes or or do something. So now I'm curious uh-huh. who else is still awake, you know? Yep. Because when you look at these last couple of pages, when he stand, the like Peacemaker 1 standing there, or Peacekeeper, I should say, not Peacemaker, yeah. uh, is standing <laughs> there on the street um, yeah, there's just like bodies, like people are just sleeping all over the mm-hmm. road, you know, the roses in the middle of them, but there's tons of people. Yeah. So it, it does make you wonder like, okay, who's immune? Why are they immune? Um, that, that's an interesting larger mystery thing to kind of like get into. So that felt like yep. it was a, that almost made it worthwhile as a tie in. I do wonder how in depth the main story of like, and her nightmare is going to feel by the time we get to the end of a second part because it is only two. I, and I think that's one of the worries I had about Night Terrors as a whole is yeah. that all these, all these tie-ins only been two issues. It's like it's not a lot of time to to do anything substantial. No. So I'm hoping no. I'm hoping it doesn't feel fluffy. I'm hoping it all works out and maybe it'll tie in neatly to the main book. You know, after issue two because issue two will be quite early next month. So yeah, yeah, we'll see see what happens from it. Well, uh, but yeah, that was not bad. What were you writing this? Oh, I'll give this a seven as well. Pretty, pretty good. Yeah, I'm happy to give it a seven. It was a quick read, uh, but mm-hmm. it, it, yeah, it was, it was, it was probably the one I enjoyed the most out of all the tie-ins. Um, all right, Night Terror's Black Adam issue one. This is Jeremy Hahn, uh, both writing and doing art. Um, oh, so interesting. Yeah, I, I read this one, and believe it or not, this was an even quicker read than. Than ravager was wow uh, yeah i went through this so quick because well it, so it's basically he's in kandak and uh i will say i do have some issues with the art i think black adam here looks super young like all the time mm-hmm. and I, it felt really weird to me uh the art's like overly clean in a way that i think was uh, a bit a detriment to him uh but you know he's, he's fighting and defending kandak as you expect um and he ends up like f- you know falling down into his nightmare he falls out the sky when he's like grabbing someone and he wait you know, he- when he stands up he's surrounded by like this monstrous face and like it's like the city's kind of coming to life around him um i will i will say the colors are quite good i do like the coloring uh even if i'm not as super thrilled on the line work mm. uh there's a-, there's a lot of good just of purples and blues and like there's a big moon in the sky it's just- it's got a nice palette yeah uh, it's got a, got a mood to it, but yeah, there's these like monsters that are like sort of like crouch like gargoyles, uh, all, all around them, all, up in the buildings, and he tries to fight them. Um, and part of the reason why this reads so quick is because it is mostly action. There's very little dialogue for the first like two thirds of the issue, and he's trying to punch, but then his powers start not working kind of correctly. He goes to fly and he ends up falling, and he's like, 
you know, what's happening. The monsters start laughing at him as they come towards him. And then eventually, when he tries to get away and he has a big light, straight, uh, lightning strike, he does get away, but then he falls out the sky, and when he stands back up, he's not Black Adam anymore. He's just, uh, you know, teenage him, right? He's, 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 he's smaller, he's, he's wearing basically underwear and nothing else, and he's like, why is this not working? And then, out of nowhere, this cat shows up, who starts talking to him. I mean, that sounds really weird and crazy when I say it like that, but like, yeah, a cat shows up and starts talking to him. Um, and I mean, in, in his dreams, I mean, that makes sense. He is, yeah. I mean, Kondok so, is, is close to Egypt, so I, it makes sense. So the cat says he's Bast, but not the Bast, right? And mm -hmm. uh, he's like, my powers aren't working. He's like, well, say the word then, you dummy. And he says, that, and what's weird is he says it once and it doesn't work, and then he says it again and it does work. Uh, but even after this, he's still, like, he can't fly still. Some of his powers aren't working properly. Uh, there is a great, probably my favorite moment of the whole issue is that he picks up the cat by the uh, back of the neck and there's a, the cat slaps him in the face. It's the best panel of the whole issue. Uh, the cat says, uh, put me down, damn it, and slaps him. It's it, That's funny. It, it's, it's the best thing in the whole issue. Uh, so him and the cat go towards uh, the big tower and they are basically just trying to figure out what's going on. Um, and then the real nightmare part of this comes in. You know, other than the fact, obviously, I get that Black Adam's scared of not having the power and being weak again. That's always like mm -hmm. a part of Black Adam. But he, he, he comes into this big building, and his son is killed by a giant... Uh, I, I don't know if this is a specific like monster from like Shazam lore. He's a big mm -hmm. lizard man. I don't know if he's like a specific lizard man. Are you sure it's not Sobek from 52? The crocodile? Oh, yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's been a while. Uh, but mm -hmm. he kills Black Adam's son and then uh, Isis and j j just kills his family. And then punches him. Or sorry, the, the crocodile punches him just out of the building. And he ends up landing in an alleyway next to the cat again. And, you know, he wants to run off and do what he can. Um, but at this point, the cat's kind of admitting that, you know, this is a, more of a nightmare uh that they're in uh the final page of the issue though is he turns around and who's there it's batman batman's there uh, of course and that's the cliffhanger at the end of the issue um if i sounded kind of unenthused reading all that out it's because i i wasn't <laughs> like <laughs> like uh, honestly this this one felt super just kind of like tie-in to me and that I mean, maybe Batman being there is a hint that Batman at some point is able to, you know, go around the different nightmares and, like, collect people or something. So maybe this is a big tease right at the very end. But it, most it, of this just kind of felt like fluff. It just kind of felt like Black Adam's scared of losing his powers. He's scared of his family dying. And that, that was it. It was mostly fighting with art that I didn't even like that much. So I didn't really get a whole lot out of this. So I was going to say, is it Batman or is it Boston brand Dead Man Batman? Like, I mean, I guess there's no way to know for sure, but it, he's not got the red text as if Boston is speaking through him. Okay. So I, I think... Now, I guess the real question is, though, is it really Batman who's showing up in his nightmare, or is this just Adam dreaming of Batman? You know, right. is, is this Batman just a part of his nightmare? Like, that's that's the real question, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, but the implication of Batman saying, Adam, we need to talk... Definitely implies to me that, he's, that it is in some form a Batman or someone coming to try and wake him up or make him realize what's going on so they can fight it. But yeah, yeah that makes sense. Yeah, I, I really wasn't feeling this issue all that much. Um, it did feel like a fluffy tie-in issue that just kind of went through the beats that like, you're not surprised by. Uh, and I read it so quick that I felt like I didn't get like a, a worthwhile time out of it. So it's a very hard one to recommend. Um, you know, will I read issue two next month? I don't know. Uh, this, this, this is the one that's definitely kind of on the... Like, Ravager 2, sure. Batman 2, we'll see how crazy that gets. This yeah. is the one where I'm like, I'm, I'm less enthused. Like, I, I didn't get enough crazy. I didn't get enough good. I just got eh in the middle. It was, yeah, it was just yeah, breezing by, it sounds like. It was just going along i mean it's interesting that if it was that he's his nightmare is that you know uh because who was it was it osiris 
Was that the kid that Isis's his brother? That so back for friends, and then he, you know, so I remember right. that in '52 when he dies, it is very shocking and very graphic. The kid gets bitten in half. Uh, and then uh, Sobek turns out to be one of Savannah's. So the fact that he's having the nightmare of of Sobek coming back and killing his son, right, and Isis and all this other stuff, it seems like they're they're playing on old Adam lore, which is kind of nice. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I don't remember any of this stuff. It's been so long since yeah. I've read 52. But uh, yeah. it's... Yeah, yeah. It's just kind of a... It's kind of a dud, I'm afraid. But... Uh, there's going to be some of these in these these tie-ins, I guess. But yeah, uh, I I wanted to try and uh, not knowing for sure which ones Matt was going to be. I knew we were going to do Poison Ivy, so I wanted to make sure I did yep. at least that or Joker. And this was definitely the one that was more appealing. Uh, but sadly, it turned out not to be mm-hmm. you know worth reading anyway. But uh, as far as the rating goes, it's pr- it's like a five. You know, it's just that middle boring territory where there's nothing particularly good. Nothing aggressively bad either, but there you go. Uh, all right, so we have one non Night Terror's new book yeah. to talk about this week, and that is Adventures of Superman John Kent, issue five. Uh, we, you know, ended the last issue with John finding out more about who this Earth Superman is, what he's done, mm-hmm. what the backstory is, and we start this issue off with him getting a deeper explanation over what the joker did to make superman yep. snap and break um and he's learned about this a uh, couple of interesting details here um uh-huh. is that he says you know what can we do i'm not sure if i can do anything um you know he says you know he, he this superman's grieving but that doesn't mean he gets a pass he has to be held accountable and everyone looks at him and he's like well i sound like him before he turned and like no you sound like lois lane and uh, so that uh, one, that one, I was like, oh man, god damn it, Taylor. That's a You're good so moment. Good. The other yeah. big thing here, though, is that, and I didn't really know this because I've not read Injustice or yeah. remember really the game story, but Harley takes this moment to say, hey, I kind of helped Joker do all this, and I, you know, I, I kind of want to apologize for it, and I didn't really, you know, Superman always kind of wins, so I just kind of assumed back then, I never took it seriously that Joker would actually yeah. pull this off. So I kind of have my part to play. And I kind of appreciate that he has John get angry. He's like, I'm not going to give you forgiveness, but just do better. Be good. Do right. things. Try and make up for it. But you're never going to get like a, a you know a thank you from me. Like, it's never... no, and the way that she does it, it's kind of clumsy, you know, not uh, on purpose, right? Which is yeah. like, I, I, I killed, you know, I had a hand in the killing of you. So this is almost like my second chance too. You know, you know, it's kind of clumsy coming out. It's like Harley's putting it together. She goes, and it's another thing that I like that Taylor does because he, you know, he wrote that Injustice book, so he is a, um, he has he has that way in of what these characters were doing, and whatnot. Uh, so to to hear that coming out of her is a pretty big, I think, especially where where the where this issue goes. Um, I think that that's a pretty crucial moment. I mean, you say a way in like th- these characters like. He wrote them all for so long that mm-hmm. they're his characters, basically. That's, these versions True. are effectively his because he, he, every bit of continuity from this universe that he's playing with, That's it's all true. stuff he did. Yeah. Well, when I, I say that, because I've also taken the video game into effect or into account and that type of stuff as well. But no, you're absolutely right. Uh, uh, you know, Injustice was his. So. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of this issue is is Damien trying to convince Superman because he's kidnapped Jay to to go and deal with Batman and cronies because John's going to help him, and it feels like the Superman's kind of reluctant to do that. But ultimately, even though the others are planning something, um, you know, to to attack the next day, sure enough, mm-hmm. Damien and this Superman and their team show up and take in all of the characters. John's already left; he's not included here. But Batman yeah. gets taken in. Harley gets taken in, Catwoman, all, all, all the whole team are taken down and arrested. Yeah. Uh, whilst John goes to the Fortress of Solitude to look at the uh, the the chip that uh, yeah. Lois gave him to to talk to. We'll, we'll get back to that. But I yeah, the the big thing for me is that you know Superman does this press conference announcing they've caught all these like you know terrorists is what he calls them the insurgents. Yeah. yeah. And the Batman and Harley are going to be executed for what they've done. Uh, Barbara and Selina will be going to prison. And the moment I really liked here, because this is actually the final page, is Bruce saying that John will stop him uh, because 
he's a superman and that still means something to him and it only took 48 hours for him to realize that you had to be stopped like that's all mm-hmm. it took um so i actually really like that like i think one yeah. of the things that taylor does really well with these you know with deceased and mm-hmm. uh this the alternate tales is that he's really good at reinforcing the fundamentals of the characters through the new context of whatever the difference is mm-hmm. so ha- having like no, being Superman meant something. It was important to everyone, and you've bastardized it, but he mm-hmm. still believes it, so he is going to stop you. Uh, and to hear that coming from this cynical-ass Batman, and Batman's always cynical, but especially in this world where but he's this had to one fight especially, Superman. Yeah, his best friend is, you know, going to have him murdered for treason, right? Like, uh, he's he's seen some things. He's done some things, so... Uh, but yeah. no, yeah, that was, that was a good fist pump moment too, where he's like, no, he's, he will stop you, you know? Yeah. And, and it ends with this Superman just getting angry and grabbing mm-hmm. Harley because she dares yep. speak in his presence. So, yep. you know, if, if you're in any doubt that this is a Superman that does need to be, uh, you know, checked at the very least, get some therapy then, <laughs> <laughs> which again, but I do like that it does show us the, from, from injustice, right. It, it kind of, there's that opening page. That, that recaps that where mm-hmm. you know um so you know it, it not that he's sympathetic right but it it it, it, it what's the word i'm looking for not reinvests but it reinforces like yeah this is a, a superman that's at his lowest and that's kind of more dangerous than evil superman like ultraman right who's just kind of evil for the sake of evil this one there's some principles to him and that makes him a bigger threat to john uh, but yeah. I like that John doesn't. John doesn't care because right is right, you know. And the Superman is not in the right. So uh, curious. Uh, not curious. I'm excited to see where this ends up. Yeah, this is a Superman who has been broken and mm-hmm. has changed where his principles lie, as opposed yep. to just you know someone who's evil and wants to rule everything. You know, it's, it's very right. different. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, so the message from Lois that he plays in the fortress, uh, John, uh, is basically just you know. <laughs> come back as soon as you can um you know uh you you know you've chosen to confront your greatest fear to help strangers that is what makes you a superman come back to me and that that's when well even before i get to the kents like coming in here because it turns out this superman's hiding these parents in the fortress yep is the idea that this gives john like his jor-el moment because he gets mm-hmm. to put in a crystal in this playback recording in so hologram his... form of, of Lois like, appears. There's something yeah. really nice and symmetrical about Lois you know, being the one who's on the Fortress recording as opposed to yeah. the Jor-El or whoever. Right. Uh, well, and too, it's Taylor, um, even just in the, the Superman book that he was doing before this, before this mini, is John was very much his mom's kid too. Right? Yeah, he's the son of Superman, but he's also the son of Lois Lane. And Taylor doesn't let us forget that. And he does it in ways like this to where it's Lois that's talking to him. And, you know, the, oh, you sounded just like her, you know, that type of stuff. The constant remembrance, like he's more than just his father's son, that Lois is just as equal. So, um, and it's, and also, gonna... it's also maybe specifically important here in the context mm-hmm. if he's fighting a, a more villainous, broken version right. of his father. So it makes sense more that he's turning to his mother's guidance his mother. for. Mm-hmm been able to fight that right right to so, counter it yeah yeah it's uh it's but, interesting because if, if, if there's anything that's going to break through to him it's maybe try to convince him what lois would think of what he's doing perhaps right and i'm sure that's been tried over the course of the entire yeah, injustice saga but through injustice but it, from my understanding is superman's logic was you know he's already gone so far he there's no turning back now like he has to maintain control but, because of what he had done but of course um, uh this coming from someone who he can recognize his dead wife in uh yeah and you know the issue like we said it starts off with those other characters mm-hmm. saying you sound like lois so yep. i don't think that's an accident that's teasing no. the fact that you know he does remind people of her right. as much as superman well and see i'm wondering if that's going to be the logic of it too is that superman's I'm like well i've already so far i you know so now it's almost he's he's being controlled by his own ego at this point of he he has to maintain control despite whatever lois would want and you know and that's what makes him the the villainous version um so uh because I, I don't know where else that's gonna go right i can't see this superman just surrendering to john right like because they have a talk about lois so I, I don't i don't imagine him going down without a fight 
you know, no, going no. out swinging. But we only so, have one issue left, I think. So we're yeah. going to see the ending next month, and mm-hmm. we'll uh, see how it wraps up. Uh, and notably, the Kents are on board with uh, John stepping in yeah. and dealing with their son because they know <laughs> they know he needs help. <laughs> he's, he's gone too far. Yeah. Well, I wonder if that's it too. Like, is that it, the big part? Is Superman admitting that he was wrong, right? And then he has to pay for. He has to, you know, go through through justice on that world. Uh, you know, uh, you can't just you know. John just can't kill him and be gone with him, right? No. But who's who's going to enforce justice on the injustice world? I guess that's the question. But I do, I do like on a lighter note, um, Jonathan Kent saying like, "Oh, you got a good name," and he says that you know, that's his name. So, eh, I like all those little light moments. Taylor's so good at, at balancing things that it's we shouldn't be su- like we. I shouldn't be surprised about it anymore, but. It's just the, the fact that he can do stuff so dark, but also he adds the, the little lightness there that may, makes it all come together. Yeah. Oh, there you go. What are you rating Adventures of Superman, John uh, Kent? This is an eight. Yeah, I mean, one thing we didn't really talk about, uh, Clayton Henry, of course, back on the art for this yeah. issue. And my usual complaints with Clayton Henry and his foreheads <laughs> uh, is here. You know, mm-hmm. so I, I I have a hard time praising the art too much. It's, I mean, it's not terrible, but like it's definitely got its quirks that I don't like. But uh, yeah, I, I would be inclined to, I think, I think I'll go 7.5. I, I think this okay. issue is very much a setup issue. I do really like the moments uh, where it connects John to Lois a bit more. And I like what Batman says to Superman at the end. Like, I really like those mm-hmm. moments. Uh, but it's, this is very much a setup issue for the final issue, so yeah, it's the sort of thing where if the art was more my taste, I probably would bump up a little bit. But I, I think as it is, I'll say seven point five. So cool. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, I've got some Patreon books every month. Patreon dot com slash TV. You can make myself or Connor read a book of your choosing at one of the higher tiers. Uh, I'm going to be talking about two today. Uh, first up is American Vampire issue thirty four which is the final of the first series, the first cycle of American Vampire. Um, and it is kind of a... Well, it feels wrong to say standalone issue, but it, like the arc ended with the last issue, and this is like almost a... a prologue for what's to come later. This is, you know, this is teasing things to come in future series. Clearly mm-hmm. they knew they were taking a break after this one, and this was an attempt to kind of like, okay, let's hook people in for some of the stuff that's coming up next. Uh, so, this is about the Grey Trader. This is what this in- this is introduces our, our new villain uh, for, mm-hmm. for the book, and the issue revolves around uh, this newer member of the VM is the bookkeeper coming to speak to uh, Felicia Book's mother, who's kind of living on her own in the middle of nowhere, and she shoots the guy with uh, like she does she has like uh, coins in her shotgun and shoots him with those. Because he tries to pretend that he's from the Census Bureau or something, and she's just like, no, nah, who are you? And threatens to shoot him in the face. And he's like, I'm from the VMs! <laughs> I'm sorry. I wasn't going to hurt you. I just need some information. Um, and he's there to talk to her. And it, it was a lot of set up and teasing for this, but she eventually brings him inside, and they get to talking about, you know, her past with, with Skinner Sweet, um, the fact that she tried to kill him, but he, he rescued her when he was still working with the VMs. Um, we got all this going. But uh, the main thing here is the Grey Trader himself, because eventually he, you know, this this guy just says, he's an America. And I, I thought he was talking about Dracula again. I thought, oh, we're bringing Dracula background. Uh, but no, we're setting up the Grey Trader, and that's what this issue is all designed to do. Um, and quite quickly after this subject comes up she's just like you need to leave like i've offered you some tea and toast but you have to go uh and sure enough uh he he tries to convince her still that you know like this threat is coming this could destroy the entire country we have to like do something about it um so he leaves kind of upset he does bring up uh, you know some other people he brings up oh your daughter's about to take over the vms he's replaced she's replacing um uh, Hobbs as the director and she's very cold about it she's like oh I didn't ask and he drives off um, 
but then we get to the, sort of the so this has all been fine up until this point it's like mm-hmm. solid enough it's setting up this new character this new threat but it's mostly just been talky it's mostly just been two people uh there's a bit of intrigue of like you know when he first shows up of her thinking he's a threat and like you know what is he there for but it, it's been fine so far but then we go to a motel and this presumably this gray trader breaks out of the concrete in the car park like he's hand almost like a hand coming through a grave but it's the concrete and we see this just silhouette of a man in like an old sort of top hat looking thing coming towards the window and the guy inside the motel working at the desk just sort of like looking over and getting scared um and it turns out this is where the young guy from the vms is staying um and there's a knock at his door and he, he grabs his gun and he looks to the peephole and this grey man, like I say, he's got like a bowler hat, top hat style thing and like an old suit, but he's presented in silhouette where you can't really see his face all on just two tiny little glimmers of light from his eyes. And we just cut to like the young guy running, like he just immediately bolts it in. You know, this is where the art really starts to shine because he's running through the car park, he's trying to get to his car and put his foot in the pedal and he's trying his best but all these hands come up from the concrete and sort of grab at him and pull him into the concrete there's a great panel where there's a hand sort of over his face as he's mostly in the concrete Mm -hmm. and he's reaching out to try and grab for help and then the very panel after that is just a hole in the concrete the silhouetted gray man just sort of like standing with his cane looking down and just in the foreground is this guy's like sort of circular eyeglasses just sort of on the ground Mm -hmm. like that's it he's gone um, and it's really, you know, it's, it's like up until now, it's been all talking and then this sequence of about three or four pages is just nothing but horror and action. And it's really tense, it's really well drawn and sets up just how much of a threat he is. And the, even him just coming for help and try to like deal with them, like he immediately sought this young guy out and killed him. Uh, and we cut back actually to when he was leaving the house uh, with Felicia's mother and she says, hey, don't stop anywhere, just... Uh, like drives st- straight back to whatever state you were in um and clearly he doesn't heed that advice he goes to the motel and that's the end of him so she clearly knows the threat of this gray man she clearly knows that mm-hmm. it was dangerous for him to be hanging around and the end of the issue is that there's another voice in there in part uh, and one thing i sort of glossed over is the reason why he came to her for information is because during her time at the vm when she was working with skinner uh she got bit by this old demon slash vampire and apparently people who get bit by them and survive start having visions uh of things to come and that's why he's come to speak to her because he wants to see if she knows anything about the future and after he leaves she goes back in the house and we hear a voice coming from somewhere else we didn't know anyone else was there and this voice just says um you used your powers and saw something didn't you Uh, and then there's a two-page spread of what looks like uh like it, it looks like pearls there it looks like only one pearl per page on this issue may i add uh mm-hmm. actually not less because it's only one page so it's but like that's, zero that's point the only pearl that's the only pearl i want to see though uh, 0.5 pearls per page in go. this particular issue uh but uh yeah we see we see her we see like you know a silhouetted figure we see like a bat monster we see this the welcome to las vegas sign uh, we see a bloody hand. We see what looks like a lot of fire. It, it looks like a vampire apocalypse is coming, basically. You know, it's, it's not too specific, but that's the mm-hmm. sort of gist you get from it. So it's, a, it's a really beautiful page. And she comes down to her basement and seemingly chained up down there is a vampire. Um, I'm not sure if it's meant to be a specific vampire, necessarily. Mm-hmm. Um, but we just sort of see the fangs in the darkness and they're crouched down and naked as if they've been kept there captive. Um, I don't think it could be Skinner, but like yeah. if, they, if they tell me otherwise later, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll be like, fair enough. Uh, mm-hmm. So, and this is set in the, uh, the 50s as well, this story. So it's setting up the new threat. It's setting up that there's this tease of something big to come. So it's quite a hyped up thing. It's kind of interesting getting to this point again because everything else that was set up in American Vampire, because it was an ongoing comic, it, it paid off in a sort of relative fashion. But because this is when it went on a big break and then it came back with like an anthology and a special and mm-hmm. uh, whatever else, it it was kind of... I, I remember feeling deflated and feeling like, are we ever going to get to the stuff that it's teasing now? I, I, I mean, I couldn't have told you that like 
for too long what it teased but i remember it teasing things and then obviously it went away for a long time and it was like really inconsistent as to when it came back and whatnot so it is nice going through it now like knowing okay the rest of it's there however much of it is left and yeah. like there's not as much after this as there was already you know the second yeah. cycle is definitely shorter so i'm curious to see uh, how it plays out and if all these things pay off um this is a decent setup issue i do think the back half uh is quite good where it gets a bit more tense and scary and actually does some horror stuff the first half is very talky talky but uh it's a solid setup issue i i'd probably only go to about a 7.5 for this one though which is lower lower compared to most issues mm-hmm. of this um the balance is maybe a little off in terms of the pacing but it, it it does what it sets out to do by the end. I, I guess the weird thing about the Grey Trader, obviously we see that he's got powers and he can like conjure other people or come through concrete. He's a bit different than just a vampire. It, if he even it's is a vampire. Like reality warping, right? Like to be able to go through the concrete and stuff like that. I, I guess maybe, but it's all it is cracking and breaking as if someone's coming through. Yeah. It, so it's not like uh, hmm. Yeah. You know, he's more like a really strong mole. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, but there you go that's american vampire issue 34 so curious to see what comes next i'll have to double check and see what the next few things are because i think there's some like really big oversized issues and depending on how big they are i may have to talk to uh tyler about how to cover yeah. them i don't i don't remember how if they're only like 50 pages and whatever but if they're so, yeah because there was the anthologies right that's what you're talking about yeah there was two of yeah. those uh, mm-hmm. and one of them is coming up either next mm-hmm. or very soon and the yeah, I might order. I might have to go pick up Second Cycle now that that I've caught up listening to you talk about these. Oh sure, and finally finally get through that. So my other Patreon book is uh, part of my Batman and the Outsiders uh, ongoing reviews is New Teen Titans issue thirty seven. This is part one of a two part crossover with Batman and the Outsiders. Uh, and the opening page of it is the you know of the time period here's your your roll call but it's got on the one side it's the titans and the other side it's the outsiders and then in the middle here's gizmo from uh the fearsome the fierce, five yeah uh, i got real excited for a hot second that it was gizmo from gremlins but that would uh, be very surprising yes yeah so I, I don't know did warner brothers own dc comics already by this point maybe because it was time no maybe not because any time bought them well no I don't even know I can't even keep it straight now yeah I don't know so, uh, yep. but uh, so yeah the, the plot of this is effectively that Gizmo breaks out the rest of the Fearsome Five from prison right that's kind of the first few pages mm-hmm. is about uh, they do this interesting thing where they've got um, Shimmer like in this like beam that the Titans gave the prison to like container uh, but Gizmo turns off the power, so like immediately she starts turning everything into tapioca, <laughs> because that like that's what the guard said. Like she was making this mm. other prisoner like bring her dinner to her on a tray, and she's like, oh yeah, if that beam wasn't on, she turned everything into tapioca. Um, uh, you know, try try and uh, meet your mate, Matt, when you're going to sniffle. <laughs> I love how you immediately did a quiet sniffle after I said that. Yep. Uh, it, right. it was that. It was that, or have a, a it drop down. Um, my sinuses just decided to drain out of nowhere, so that's fun. Um, anyway, so so Shimmer is breaking out, uh, and then her brother Mammoth. And tra- they basically say here that yeah, he could break out whenever he wants, but he doesn't want to unless like his sister's also breaking out. So when he he finds out that his sister's breaking out, uh-huh. he's like, all right, okay, smashing down some walls. It's time to go. Uh, <laughs> And um, as he's breaking out, Doctor Light's like behind the cell, being like, "Hey, come on, old old friend, please let me out. I'll give you anything you want. I'll pay you. I'll pay you." Because at first he doesn't want to, but he, he agrees to ultimately. Right, dumb dumb mammoth is one of my favorite tropes throughout the Titans books. It's like he's just this big hunk of muscle that will do anything for his sister. Uh, so that that's very funny that he could have he could have been broken out last week, but you know Shimmer didn't want to yeah uh, so they break out and of course simon's the last one he he saw so, because at, at one point uh like a few of them are standing outside now but all the prison guards are just standing still in fact uh dr light drops a twilight zone reference he references an old episode of twilight zone where everyone's standing still uh which i have seen that episode and remember it yep. so very well done uh yep. 
so Simon it turns out he's the one making them all stand still, obviously, with his powers, uh, being the psychic that he is, and everyone runs off. So there's a really weird thing throughout this issue, I'll just sort of sum it up here, where Dr. Light keeps thinking he's the one in charge of the Fearsome Five and keeps trying to convince the others that he is, but every single one of them like, no, Simon's in charge, shut up, Dr. Light, no one wants you here. Isn't Dr. Light, he's not really in the Fearsome Five though, right? Like, he's just there because... Not really, but he, he, he was saying that, like, I formed right. this team, and I'm like, did you? I don't think you did. <laughs> Uh, he's a he's cuckoo bird anyways yeah yeah so that's the whole thing uh and then they're they're back in costume uh and yeah yeah what was it was it uh yeah he says i hey i didn't form the fearsome five so we could admire each other uh we're here to satisfy our mutual uh desire for for wealth um (laughs) and immediately uh, Shimmer just says, pipe down <laughs> light. That is, this feels very modern in the storytelling, because I can, I can see something like this in a rogues comic, right? Where oh, sure, yeah, yeah. They pick somebody up, and one of the other rogues is just like, no, what, what are you doing? Yeah, so what's interesting is that the reason why she's looking at the paper is she notices that Dr. Jace is in town, mm-hmm. and that's of interest to her, right? So they want to go after Dr. Jace. Um, and they explain that this is how uh, her and her brother got their powers. Uh, she's the one that gave them their powers. And there's a little hmm. sort of montage series of panels of like them being pulled out of school in the camp because everyone was scared of them. Because of, well, uh, yeah, scared of them because they were different. Because oh, oh, sorry, they did, Jace didn't give them her powers, but she like took them in and like held okay. them control. Like, so are them. they sorry. Markovian? Is that something I never no, knew? No, no, I was getting no. I was getting mixed up because the Markovians yeah, sure. come into it later. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Now they were already like super powered, but she brings them in and like gotcha. does tests on them and and whatever. Mm-hmm. So they want Doctor Jace, which I never actually thought of this when I realized there was going to be a crossover. That mm-hmm. when the Titans and the the Outsiders like meet up, that oh yeah, uh, Geoforce and Terra are going to be like. <laughs> we know each other, don't we? Yeah, yeah we're siblings. Whoa! Uh, so it never occurred to me that that was going to be the connective tissue. I just kind of, I don't know what I assumed, but uh, sure enough, we're at Titan's Tower. Uh, Terra, her bracelet starts going off. And it makes sense that we start with the Titans after we've introduced the villains, because it is their comic, technically, this one. Um, but her, her like beeper thing goes off, saying that Jace is nearby. So she just like ditches the Titans and flies off in a bit of rock. Uh, and she was just, she was trying to convince the others to tell them their secret identities because they've still not trusted her enough. And right. she actually mentions in her thought bubble, like, yeah, I, I need to act cool around them so they don't suspect that I'm working for the Terminator. This is the era, of course, where uh, Deathstroke was oh. Deathstroke, the Terminator, and was yep. constantly referred to as just the Terminator. And I guess that's because the Terminator movie was a big deal in the 80s. But... Well, this is from 83. Terminator came out in 84, right? Oh, that's true, yeah. So maybe... So... Yeah, maybe, I, I guess I've never really thought about it, but I suppose maybe they, they stopped using it as much because Terminator became yeah. synonymous with something well, else. And Deathstroke the Terminator is, like, that's an extra name. Pick yeah, one. Yeah, he, he doesn't need it. Yeah, Deathstroke's no, fine no. on its own. And, and I prefer Deathstroke anyways, because t- to me, Terminator conjures, you know, Arnold and robot skeletons and yeah. all that stuff. So, but, uh, no, so the Judas contract stuff is really, really at play here. So, but I think what the, this issue does really well, actually. So it spends a good, like, six pages or whatever is just, like, here's the villains breaking out, and then here's what they're going, their goal is. It's Dr. Jace. But, so when Tara gets this call, and she goes flying for the source of the call, or this, this signal, um, when she gets to the location, the Fearsome Five have already kidnapped Jace, and it's like the outsiders are already there, and they're, like, investigating the crime scene, and that's how they all come together. So... It, it does play with that thing where it, it basically skips out some of the stuff that it doesn't need to explain. It just kind of like f- throws you into it a little bit further. It's a nice little surprise that the outsiders are already there. Like, cause you'd maybe expect, oh, like they're going to run into each other. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're going to see like the, you know, the other scene where the outsiders realize they want to go there or we're going to see Geoforce get the signal thing. Cause he also has a signal that leads them there. Um, but no, it, instead like Terra, arrives and they're already there investigating and you know you may also expect oh maybe jace will be there and they'll just miss her or whatever but no it's already happened she's already been kidnapped i like that it was kind of like keeping me on my toes a little bit with like how much we're progressing through the story so i i appreciated that maybe some of the smart smart structuring that it's done so far mm-hmm. uh, in this this run um uh, 
immediately though terror wants to like fight uh as you expect um so uh yeah so katana as well is a bit hot-headed she wants to jump in and fight uh so terra fights halo a little bit eventually metamorpho cams have written down by just like forming like a steel dome around her um which lasts for a little while until she eventually just sort of burrows up from the ground because you know she's she's terra so mm-hmm. she just sort of goes down and under and comes up somewhere else uh but we have our typical team up thing where all of the, the hero teams like sort of arrive and they have to fight each other a little bit until eventually um you know i think it's like you know starfire and and raven and uh some of the others like hey we should stop but eventually of course what actually stops it is terra notices geoforce and the hog and they're all like wait a minute what and like oh yeah we're brother and sister um what's interesting is that uh there's a little speech or thought bubble here from from uh beast boy where he's like this is strange they both have the same costume but terra told me that she made her costume or herself but and obviously this kind of says that's bullshit because mm-hmm. why would he show up with the exact same color scheme and uh and whatnot so it, it, that's obviously advancing some ongoing plots in new teen titans which is the the plot of her not being trustworthy and everything that's building up to the judas contract and all that nonsense um so not only though the people who are absent here are batman and robin because you're like you know the leaders of both teams um also know each other <laughs> and would probably put a stop to all this fighting quite quickly and of course donna and core are like hey we kind of have to get our leaders here to talk talk about this because there's a lot going on here and we actually go to Wayne Manor where Dick's basically telling Bruce, you know, I think we're done being Batman and Robin together. Like, I don't want to stop being, you know, Dick Grayson and Bruce Wayne friends, but I think I need to go off on my own. And I was not expecting a young Jason Todd to come into the room. Like, this is literally the panel. Yeah. He, he says, hey, are you joking? Can I become the new Robin? <laughs> He's just hanging out. <laughs> like, like, like Batman's just keeping kids in the cave or what? Like, you know what's so weird is that I've went back and read like some of the like his story of becoming Robin. But yeah. the weird thing is, is that there was already issues of him being Robin before then, and then they explained it later. And right. It's weird to every time I'm reminded, like his introduction is so weird, and like even this, he's just around as a kid before you know. Well, Dick still be. I, I don't know. I'm just saying. Clearly, along the way here in continuity, there was some, like, mixing and fudging of things as to, like, his introduction as the new Robin. Like, this doesn't seem very neat. Because this is much earlier than I would have expected to see him. This Because, like you said, this is, like, 83 or whatever it is. Uh-huh. I wouldn't have expected to see him for another, like, three or four years. But here we are. <laughs> well, yeah, because he dies in, what, 88? Is that when Death in the Family is? Oh, something like that, yeah. Yeah. So he he already wore out his welcome in like four years, right? Because if this is, I think this issue came out in December of. So I look, I just looked it up. Uh, um, well, well, that that date will be like the the sell by date, which is like three right. months later. But yeah. 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 So we're, we're we're close to eighty four, regardless. So he wears out his welcome in like four years, but it, that's so funny. Oh, uh, could I be Robin? Notably, oh. he's blonde here because I've seen him be be brown hair i've seen him be ginger uh, and apparently he was blonde to begin with as well so well yeah because I, I do know that morrison during his batman and robin run um they they made it that i think jason had had naturally red hair but bruce made him dye it mm. uh, so he looked like dick but i never knew if that was just something that jason was doing because you know as that redhead character he was a little bit crazy or whatnot but seeing that he sh- showed up as three different hair colors in that short of a time it just really showed that they weren't keeping track of it yeah or, or maybe morrison's just sort of thinking that this blonde as more ginger yeah. uh, i guess maybe. but uh yeah. dick's also like wait you haven't told your team what your secret identity is yet uh and let's That's be so honest funny. the outsiders have, have looked pretty stupid they even say later on that their home base is bruce wayne's penthouse and i'm like guys Come on, put two and two together here. Put two and two together, I beg you. Uh, but yeah, sure enough, uh, we see the villains, and yes, Simon obviously has nefarious plans. Um, he wants to to use uh, Doctor Jace to 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 you know 
make them all more powerful, make more threats, all that kind of thing. He wants to increase the intensity of his attack and create uh, more permanent damage. And Jesse's like, I don't want to do that. <laughs> but, uh, so Batman with the Outsiders and the Titans are all at Titans Tower and they're debating what to do about uh, Jace being kidnapped. So, uh, yeah. Uh, and th- there it takes like, an interesting turn here where it, it, we see what they're actually accomplishing with Jace. So they find like these dead guys uh, who were helped commit a robbery or something, but like from like the stomach down, they're made of mud. They're like half mud people. Um, but they're all they're all well. They say technically they're not dead, but they're not really alive either. They're just kind of catatonic in this weird state, and it's clear that there's some weird experimentation's been going on. Uh, Raven's able to use her empath abilities to kind of like look into one of their minds, though, to like see what's going on. Um, and that's how they realize who's behind all this, because up until this point they didn't know it was the fearsome five. So she's like, "Oh, I see Doctor Light and Mammoth and blah blah blah," um, and that kind of mm-hmm. sets up, uh, you know. This back chunk of the issue, uh, which is them looking into to all this, and they make haste to try and find the Fearsome Five. Um, and it turns out the Fearsome Five have effectively, clearly using Simon's powers, they've recruited like everyone that was in this like bar or pub to like just like go to where their their base is right so so the two teams like come and investigate this place and the barman's like yeah it's weird like they all just stood up and walked out like like there were zombies and this is basically their next batch of test subjects so the teams race to try and save all these people that have been kidnapped uh with psychic powers and when they get there uh you know they fight the fearsome five a little bit you know metamorpho tries to like block shimmer's hand so she can't transmute anything but the big ending of the issue is that these fully formed mud monster people all come out. Mm-hmm. So Ooh, it's it's, it it's worked. Whatever whatever they were trying to do. So basically, like it, this feels really like weird for Simon. Like I want like mud henchmen. I want like mud monster henchmen that can fight for me. <laughs> like this feels like so much more like comical to me than like yeah. the nefarious plots that I think he would want to do. But sure enough. Um, yeah, so, yeah, the, 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 the book ends, um, with Simon going supernova, he's got, like, a device rigged up, uh, he's like, okay, the, the team, you know, the Outsiders and the Titans are still fighting our, our, our henchmen, um, and he's, like, he, he presses a button, and then you see, like, the art has these big shock waves coming from his mind, and it looks like the island that they're on, which is, like, the sort of mm-hmm. prison island next to the city, it looks like it blows up, it straight up looks like a nuke went off, and then the last few pages are the Fearsome Five and Simon's protective bubble landing on the pier, and they're like, "We have killed them all. We have killed. We've killed the Outsiders. We've killed the Titans. Now we can go conquer the world." And that's the cliffhanger. So it looks like he's just blown up all of these characters. Obviously, I suspect that somehow they yes. have survived because it's a comic book and there's a part two. But that is the so. And I had a lot yeah. of fun with this. Um, it has a lot of characters, which is, you know can be a lot to juggle, and it's very dialogue mm-hmm. heavy. But I enjoyed that it took the time to really like introduce all the villains at the start. So even though it's been a while since I've read any Teen Titans, it was like, okay, you've made it very clear who these characters are and what their powers are. And there's even some comedy with Doctor Light trying to act like he's in charge, but he's not. He's kind of yeah, so. I like, looked that up, and he did form the team by putting a newsletter out. Um, oh, like. He put it, he placed an ad in the Underworld Star Criminal Underground Newsletter. That's he formed the group to attack the Teen Titans, but Simon, who's under the influence of the demon uh, Trigon, that used sounds, Sir role yeah, as the leader. That so, sounds familiar, actually. This does yeah. actually sound, this is ringing a bell. But it does make it funny that he's kind of Michael Scott in that, that he's trying to establish that he's in charge, but nobody's listening to him. <laughs> um, that makes it funnier, because if he's actually, you know, I formed the team. He's like, yeah, whatever. Um... But yeah, so... That was pretty amusing. Uh, I enjoyed that. I enjoyed the continuity stuff of like, okay, this is like how all these characters learn about Terra and Geoforce Mm -hmm. being together. And what I like about that, even though I'm not reading New Teen Titans right now, and I've only read so much of that, Mm -hmm. I do actually really like how this enforces how much of a big deal it's going to be when it turns out she's a bad guy to everyone else. Because now she has a brother who is you know, who is a good guy, who is... Mm -hmm is kind of almost vouching for who she is by association. 
and you know it, it means someone personally will also have a problem with her turning to be a bad guy and will care when she you know ultimately you know spoilers here but she dies <laughs> um like it, it adds it, it feels like this is truly if anything it feels like it's more a part of the new teen titan story obviously i think maybe the next issue will be a bit more skewing towards outsiders since outsiders. it's the outsiders issue yeah but I do like how it's contributing to that continuity and it felt like a big deal to have them all realize this for the first time and be like, oh shit, this is a big, this is like a big part of her character we're revealing here. Um, and it's also a big part of continuity between her, Geoforce, Jace, all the Markovia stuff. It feels like it's really kind of developing that a little bit, um, mm-hmm. which is nice. Uh, plus, you know, dipping into a bit of Batman continuity as well with the Dick and Bruce relationships, also nice to see. Uh, the Fearsome Five are a fun set of villains though. There's a nice dynamic between them. Um, I, very different set I of do powers. love them. Yeah, they are, they are like just those. You know, anytime you need Titans villains, the Fearsome Five are there. Uh, they have great chemistry. Yeah, so. it's kind of you know obviously you've got Deathstroke to be their like arch uh-huh. nemesis, like the the, the threat. Yeah. Fearsome Five feel more like their fun rogues team. You know, yeah. the Flash's rogues. That's what they feel like. Yeah, and as long as you have you know Simon Mammoth Shimmer. And Gizmo, that fifth spot, I always kind of like that they can keep it, oh, keep right. it open. I'm I'm mixing my comparisons up here, but yeah. it's almost like Deathstroke's kind of like their Lex Luthor. Obviously, they're not that much alike, but I, yeah, I mean in comparison to say a Dark Side, which is I would say their tri- tri- Trigon is to the Teen Titans. Right, it's their big, you big know. heavy. He's the big heavy from another place. Yeah. You know, not a planet in this case, an old dimension. You know, hell or right. whatever, but. Uh, like so, I I do appreciate because even when the fearsome five are introduced, that, that Trigon stuff's going on as well at the same time. Yeah. So they're kind of the fun other side of the villains, whereas Trigon's this big, oh, really scary threat. You know, I really hope that they make an appearance in the uh, in the Tom Taylor Titans book. Oh, I can yeah. see him doing it because right. I, I. But specifically, I want this version with, with you know, you know, kind of <laughs> talking <laughs> down Doctor Light. And whatever. You so. want Dr. Light to be the Jerry of yes. the Fearsome Five. Yeah, my God. They just keep him around to abuse him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. You know what? I could see Gizmo as as Tom. You know, he's he's always got all his little gadgets, right? He's kind of little, always following around. So uh, yeah. it really checks out. But yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it's all the out of 10 for me in this issue. I had a really good time. Good. Uh, probably my favorite thing I read this week, actually. Uh mm-hmm. Just in general, <laughs> including nice. all the new books. Uh, but there you go, that's my Patreon books. Uh, so yeah, you go to patreon.com slash TV and help support all the content. And you can do that at any tier, but the the, 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 the big the expensive tier gets you a, a yeah. comic review uh, of your choosing. Uh, so yeah, there you go. That is uh, that is all that stuff. So that'll take us out of the part of the show where we pick our favorite stuff of the week, favorite panel slash moment, favorite cover, favorite art. And of course, we'll rank our top five books. So, uh, Matt, what is your favorite panel slash moment, and why right. is it the giant perils? <laughs> yeah, right. Um, this one it wasn't it wasn't as hard. Uh, one came to mind, and it's from uh, the Adventures of Superman, and it's when they they mentioned to John that it sounded like something his mom would say. Mm. So that that really resonated. So, I mean, my serious answer would also be from that, and it would be. Um, you know, he's going to stop you because he's still Superman and that still means yeah. something to him. I really like that line. Uh, but the giant pearls did make me laugh a lot. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm surprised you didn't go with the, the gunhead bat. Gunhead bat was also pretty funny. Like, I, yeah. You know, these things didn't make me laugh, but my serious answer yeah. is the line from Superman. Uh, cover of the week. Uh, there's multiple Matina covers this week. And funnily enough, the one for Night Terror's Batman does kind of hint at the bat gun, but yeah. it's not actually a gun that's in the head. It's more like a, it's more like Terminator's eye. It's like a red laser yeah. sight in the middle of this. Yeah. It looks cooler. Though. It looks way better than the thing in the comic. This looks like a. Or, well, and it's big and imposing. It's like a giant too. It, like, you know it looks like massive. It, it looks like a cybernetically enhanced bat. That's yeah. what it looks like. It looks like a bat that's in the future that's went and got like an enhancement to make himself yes. tougher, and it looks scary. If this thing showed up looking like that, that would be something. I was like, give Williamson enough time, and instead of Cyborg Superman, we'll have the Cyborg Batman. Yeah. So there's, there's also a Matina cover for the uh, the main book, First Blood, uh, which is is pretty nice as well. Yeah. 
Uh, there's a really cool wind cover for Ravager, which is red and black with a bit of white. Uh, mm-hmm. Really, really nice. Uh, but I, I think I have to go with the 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 Matina Batman cover, the 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 giant, scary, horrific yeah. bat with the cybernetic looking eye. Uh, is really cool. Mm-hmm. So, what you, what you got? Yeah, so uh, mine's gonna be from Poison Ivy, but I want to shout out a couple of them. <laughs> I'm shocked. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, there's there's the the main cover, which which is nice. It's got like the you know housewarming scene, but there's a uh, a Dustin Wynn uh, red cover that just looks you know fits the Night Terrors vibe. Um, but mine mine's going to be the McKelvey. It's got uh, from Poison Ivy. It's got Harley and Ivy sitting on the couch, but. When you look behind them, everything's kind of a miss. Like there's handprints of blood on the windows and, you know, uh, it looks like a house on fire next door. So, you know, everything is nice and in, inside domestic bliss, but on the outside is more, which is kind of what the theme of the, the issue was. So, uh, but yeah, that's mine. Yeah, very good. Uh, Art of the week. This one's a bit tougher because um, I wasn't I in love with a lot I- of the art. I don't think it has. I guess easily Dexter Story for Ravager. Yeah, well, that's what I was gonna say. It's the Dexter Story art, but I was trying to, I was trying to see if there's any others that would spring to mind, but really not. Howard Porter is really fitting in certain moments, but mm-hmm. not in other moments. Gellar March, I just straight up don't like. Yeah. Uh, the Clayton art and... Henry just misses it for me. This, but that's because yeah. of Clayton Henryness. Yeah, uh, I think Black Adam. I didn't really like the look of that much. So yeah, for me, it's easily Dexter Story. Uh, it's the most consistent. It looks great the entire time. Uh, yeah, our of the week for me. Uh, yep. All right, rank your top five, Matt. All right, so one's gonna be Adventures of Superman. Two is gonna be First Blood. Uh, three is Ravenger. Four is Ivy. Five is Batman. Yeah, number one for me is Adventures of Superman. Number two. Yeah, it's probably First Blood still. And then Ravager. Number three. Number four. I. Uh. <laughs> number four I, g- I guess Batman o- over Adam yeah because at least it was funny okay yeah, and then, a little bit out of it and then five black Adam I guess uh-huh. wait hold on did I did I not read six three four five yeah hey, you read five oh, no I didn't read yeah I didn't read Poison Ivy you're right you're right hey. I'm like I was like why why is that even making I thought I had another one somewhere but apparently not mm-hmm. uh, okay well there you go uh now, obviously, average ratings this week, uh, not that great across the board. You know, my high, I peaked at a 7.5, so, which is not mm-hmm. a great week, uh, to be fair. But, hey, I at least was entertained by some of the badness that I did read. So that's that's something. Uh, I enjoy my Patreon books. <laughs> that's something. Uh, so I'll tell you what's coming next week from DC Comics. Uh so we have Night Terrors issue one, aka Night Terrors issue two. <laughs> um, yep. We have Superman Lost issue five. We have World's Finest Teen Titans issue one, uh, which is the tie-in to the the other Mark Wade book. So that should be an interesting mm-hmm. thing to check out. Uh, we have Unstoppable Doom Patrol issue four. I'm very happy that's still going uh, with yep. Night Terrors on. Uh, we have Danger Street issue seven. Mm-hmm. We have Night Terror's Green Lantern issue one, Night Terror's Robin issue one, Night Terror's Shazam issue one, Night Terror's The Flash issue one, Spirit World issue three, Night Terror's Zatanna issue one, Batman Incorporated ten, Wildcats issue nine, uh, Multiversity Harley screws up the DCU issue five, The Batman Scooby Doo Mysteries issue ten, and Looney Tunes issue two seven three. Uh, so a little bit more next week. Um, there's definitely a more interesting batch of tie-ins overall, I'd say. But honestly, more than anything, I'm excited for Doom Patrol and Danger Street. And I guess the Mark Wade book, because it's new. See how that is. Yeah. Um, I don't know. The Zatanna book looks pretty good. I mean, it's got Robot Man on the cover, so... Sure. I'm, you know, I'm excited for that. I, lo- I do love Lady Z, so... Uh, but yeah, I'm looking at kind of the other ones. Maybe Shazam? Uh, who's the creative team on that one? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, it says it's Wade. Mark Wade. Okay. Yeah. And Roger Cruz on art, so it's it's the same, right? Yeah. No, Mora does the art. Uh, what did Roger Cruz? Roger Cruz just did Flash, though. Um, that should be okay. We'll see. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's got the, Mary. So it's the regular writer. Uh, same with Green Lantern. At least he's mm-hmm. co-writing. Uh, Jeremy Adams at least co-writing that book. Maybe yeah. he's, maybe it's a backup that he's not doing. But 
yeah so so yeah there's some interesting ones out next week uh there's definitely some that are feel more important to me to check out than others but yes we'll see how it goes mm -hmm. uh so yeah who's writing the zatanna one uh dennis culver that does not move the needle for me either positively or negatively <laughs> no it's it culver does books like this right like that that's yeah. where i remember the last time i went on my way to read culver and i don't i don't remember uh, oh, well. it's usually yeah oh well we'll see how week two and eight towers does yeah. uh like i say matt, matt will be swapping out for connor next week and then hopefully we have a full trio show uh, in the not too distant future yeah. but uh that is the plan for next week because mm -hmm. matt's doing something i don't know I'm going out of town for, right. for the weekend. Yep. Okay. Uh, unimportant stuff. How dare, yes. you, how dare you when there's comics yeah. to be talked about. But anyway, <laughs> that is the show. Thank you very much for joining us. You can support all the content over at patreon.com slash Uh Of course, let us know what you think uh, on the books, on Twitter, or on YouTube, or whatever you'd like. But that is the show, so thank you once again for watching or listening. We always appreciate it. Keep reading DC Comics, and remember to never get lost in the Speed Force.